uh, I'll call the Green Mountain Care Board's uh, meeting of uh, May 3rd um, to order. Today we have two primary agenda items. We have um, a presentation um, from Mark Hage uh, relating to reference-based pricing, and we also have uh, a review of One Care's um, budget, final budget submission. Um, so thank you all for being here today. We're excited about hearing uh, more about reference-based pricing. And I'll turn it to uh, Ms. Barrett, our executive director, for her report. Thank you, Chair Foster. I'll start out with some scheduling updates. As a reminder, we will be back um, meeting on Friday, starting at 8.30 in the morning. Uh, we will be uh, hearing from One Care Vermont. And they'll be reporting in on their revised budget. Today, we're hearing just from the staff, um, from our staff. And then um, exciting news, we, the Green Mountain Care Board, are going out on the road. Um, we are going on June 7th to the Morrisville area and Lamoille County. Um, as folks may recall, at the end of last year, um, we had a traveling board meeting to Rutland, and we'll be using um, the same format where board members will separate out in their two by two so as not to have a quorum and visit um, healthcare entities as well as some nonprofits and some businesses in Lamoille County. And then at one o'clock, we'll have our regularly scheduled board meeting, which will be live and in person. Yeah, in I, thought, I thought you guys introduced a, a pass oh. with a youth price. Excuse me, I think if you're not speaking, could you just our mute? Our price for that is um, under the age oh, of... Um, Mr. Hoffman? Can you, can you hear me? Could, here, I'll... I'll you. Can you move? I, I can't mute him. So. I think I can. Oh, no, I see. I see. The youth season pass is. Thank you very much. So, um, as I was saying, we will be in Lamoille County and in Morrisville on June 7th. More details will be posted on our website uh, very shortly. So I'd encourage uh, folks who can attend to please attend our meeting in Morrisville. Uh, we have a couple of public comment updates. Uh, we'll be extending the public comment period for One Care Vermont's revised budget till May 24th. Um, if we do not um, vote um, at, at the, I think the, the next week is the, the uh, voting um, scheduled vote. If we are extending that, we will extend the public period, public comment period accordingly. Um, so please, if you do have public comments on One Care of Vermont's revised budget, please get those to the board in order for them to consider it before they do have a vote on the budget. And then we also have an ongoing public comment period on um, the potential next all-payer model. We share all those comments that we receive with the Agency of Human Services and the administration as they are leading the negotiations on that potential model. So with that, I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Um, we'll take up the meeting minutes from April 19th, 2023. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. Second. Any board discussion? Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, there are four ayes, and Member Lunge is uh, not here today, so the motion carries and the minutes are approved. Um, next, we're going to turn to Mark Hage. For those of you who don't know Mark Hage, he is the Director of Benefit Programs for the Vermont NEA. Vermont NEA is the um, educators union. Um, and I'll let Mr. Hage uh, explain a little bit about what they do, um, their membership numbers and the scope of their work. And presenting with Mr. Hage uh, is Marilyn Bartlett, who's a senior policy fellow from the National Academy for State Health Policy, which we call NASHPE, and Chris Deacon um, from Versan Consulting. And she's the former director of state benefits for uh, New Jersey. 
Um, so, Mr. Hage, I'll turn it to you, and thank you very much for doing this. And just for everyone's awareness, um, the board is doing a series of educational roundtables, um, and this is part of that series. The last board meeting, we had a presentation on primary care um, provider uh, issues in the state. And before that, we had some on um, what's traditionally called the cost shift, and this is part of that process. And what we're trying to do is ensure that we're informed and the public's informed of strategies we can use and things we should be thinking about in Vermont for um, curbing uh, some of the challenges we have in healthcare. So I really appreciate Mr. Hage putting this together. It's a huge effort on his behalf and the team's behalf to do this, and they do it out of their own interests and, and helping the state. So thank you very much, Mr. Hage. I'll turn it to you. Chair Foster, thank you for the kind words. Good afternoon, all. I'm Mark Hage. As Chair Foster said, I'm the Director of Benefit Programs at the Vermont National Education Association, or the state's largest union with 12,000 members. So while I'm here today in that capacity, I'm also a trust administrator for the Vermont Education Health Initiative, which serves 35,000 school employees, active and retired, and their dependents. And we offer a range of health insurance benefits. My remarks today will be brief, um, and then I want to turn things over to Marilyn Bartlett and Chris Deacon, who will introduce themselves and who will kick off this presentation. So first, though, I want to thank the board for inviting Marilyn and Chris and myself to speak today. And also, I want to express my gratitude to Susan Barrett, who worked with me over a long stretch to make this event possible. She was very patient and gracious. In May of last year, while addressing this body, with fellow healthcare reform advocates, and we spoke to a variety of topics. At that time, I urged you to consider reference-based pricing, benchmarked Medicare rates as a way to reimburse our hospitals fairly. My position on this matter has not wavered. Indeed, it is even more resolute. And I was inspired to make that recommendation last year in large measure because of what Marilyn Bartlett had accomplished in Montana. Uh, when I received news of that event, I must confess, well, there's very little that surprises me anymore in the world of health insurance and health care. I was stunned by that news, and in part because I had been told for 20 years it wasn't possible to actually lower health care costs and hospital costs in particular without compromising access to care, and Maryland proved that that was not indeed the case. In due course, Marilyn introduced me to Chris Deacon and her exceptional work formerly on behalf of the state of New Jersey and now as an independent consultant in other domains. Both of these individuals have been incredibly valuable to me as counselors, and I have a great deal to thank them for. They've been very gracious with their time as well. Since the Montana Initiative, other states to varying degrees have followed Montana's example. Oregon, North Carolina, Colorado, Washington, and Nevada and more will be coming. I have no doubt of that. And this is because hospital prices, as we know, are a major driving force behind escalating healthcare costs, causing an immense amount of financial and medical harm to individuals, families, and employers, both public and private sector. And I'm someone who takes calls every single day from school employees and their families, or from school district personnel who are struggling with this reality. We certainly need our hospitals and we need them to be adequately and sustainably financed. On those points, there's no disagreement, but we need prices to come down. We need hospital care to be far more affordable and transparent and without the wild and irrational price variations for the same services statewide. What you'll hear today from Marilyn and Chris affirms that we do not have to find ourselves trapped every year, ritualistically in expressions of anger, freedom or hopelessness as hospital prices continue to rise and as healthcare becomes less affordable and less accessible. The systemic problems in healthcare are human made, which means they can be overcome by human resolve and by empirically grounded reforms and public regulation that's dedicated to the well-being of all and to models of financing that are sustainable and accountable to all. So I will end these remarks where I began last May. I still continue to believe passionately that reference-based pricing deserves our service and sustained attention. So thank you. And uh, I'll let Marilyn and Chris, as I said, introduce themselves and get to the heart of the matter. Marilyn, would you like to start? 
Yes, I'm uh, Marilyn Bartlett, Senior Policy Fellow with uh, Nashby, and I'll be doing a little bit of a presentation today about the Montana story and some things that we're working on further with a focus on reference-based pricing. And I just wanted to add that uh, we've done a lot of work from Nashby's level to support Indiana. Indiana uh, really worked hard and they just both ha parts of the legislature the house and the senate just passed hb 1004 capping hospital prices as a multiple of medicare the original intent the original language was 260 percent i believe that's now 285 percent the economic study that was done shows that that would save uh the citizens of Indiana, close to 1.3 billion. So uh, that now is at the governor's desk for hopeful approval. So I just wanted to add that to the bucket, but Chris, you take the lead on this. Sure, thanks, Marilyn. Um, and thank you so much. It's such an honor to come speak with um, you all and the important work that you're doing to um, bring change and innovation and promote high quality, affordable healthcare for Vermont. Um, so I'm just going to do sort of a brief intro to uh, what is reference-based pricing um, and, and in particular, how does reference-based pri reference pricing fit into the current um, political, uh, political regulatory dynamic with some changes um, being discussed in Washington on site neutrality, transparency, et cetera, and really see how reference-based pricing fits into that and can fit into that. Uh, a little bit more background about me. I'm a lawyer by training. I'm not a clinician. Um, don't uh, don't throw things at your screen. Um, <laughs> but I came I came to healthcare um, sort of uh, later in my career after being engaged in private practice um, as a deputy attorney general for the state of New Jersey, and then assistant counsel to the governor's office, um, where I was then asked to run the state health plan for about 820,000 public sector lives. Um, one of the largest health plans in the country, and we did some really good work. Um, but I was able to see firsthand, uh, really, uh, you know, some of the uh, the misaligned incentives in healthcare, um, and how difficult it can be for policy leaders to um, stand up and make difficult decisions um, to make healthcare more affordable and accessible accessible for their um, citizens and for members. So with that, I'm going to jump right in. Um, I'm going to give, again, a bit of background about reference-based pricing, and then I'm going to turn it over to Marilyn to really review the Montana story and share some more specific financial information with respect to hospitals, um, hospital system in Vermont specifically, um, with the reference-based uh, pricing background. So reference-based pricing is a healthcare strategy that sets limits on how much a payer um, will pay for certain medical procedures, treatments, services, drugs, et cetera, based on a benchmark or reference price. Um, you know, and this approach really can be beneficial for a few reasons. First, cost control. By using reference-based pricing, um, payers can set a limit on how much they're willing to pay for certain medical procedures, treatments, and services. Obviously, this helps to control costs and prevent uh, price inflation, and certainly in the sense of hospital prices, runaway price inflation. Transparency. Um, Reference-based pricing really lends itself to a more transparent world. It allows for transparency in pricing and helps patients, um, patients and payers be able, and payers, I mean self-funded entities and those purchasing on members' behalf, to compare prices across different providers, hospitals, and medical facilities. We can then make informed decisions about the healthcare that we're purchasing for ourselves and the healthcare that we're purchasing on behalf of our members if we're an employer purchaser. Competition. Um, Reference-based pricing can promote competition amongst healthcare providers by encouraging them to offer services at a competitive price, a competitive and transparent price that falls within that reference price range. They can then differentiate themselves based on things like quality, right, and uh, member experience, which is something that I think we all can agree um, we want to improve upon. Uh, inevitably, this leads to um, lower prices for patients. And then finally, value-based care. 
reference-based pricing um, doesn't surplant or sort of uh, is not uh, mutually exclusive with value-based care. In fact, it can incentivize healthcare providers to really focus on delivering high cost, uh, I'm sorry, high quality cost effective care that meets the needs of patients. Um, and in this way, patients and those that are purchasing on their behalf receive the best value um, for their healthcare dollar. So in summary, reference-based pricing can be an important tool for controlling healthcare costs and promoting some really key, um, uh, key characteristics that we want to see in the market, and that's transparency, increased competition, and this increased movement towards a value-based care model. And I believe that the Green Mountain Care Board's cost containment efforts um, can really be um, uh, augmented, if you will, through these healthcare um, cost control mechanisms. Um, I also want to address, as I mentioned briefly, how reference-based pricing can fit sort of into some of the national conversations about um, additional uh, cost control methods. Um, and one of them being uh, site neutrality, site neutral payments. Um, I had the privilege of being in Washington with both with Marilyn um, and with another team before the House Energy and Commerce um, committee, as well as Ways and Means, and site neutrality was the issue du jour, um, in addition to beating up on PBMs, but that's sort of old news. Um, site neutrality definitely took a close second. Um, so it's important to note here that site neutral payments and reference-based pricing are models that can absolutely coexist in the healthcare system and the payment system, um, although they are not the same thing. Um, you know, site neutral payments refer to a payment methodology in which medical services are reimbursed at the same rate, regardless of site of care. So for example, if a patient receives an MRI at a hospital, the hospital may be paid more than if the patient receives that MRI at an outpatient imaging center. So site neutral payments are intended to really address this disparity by paying the same amount for the exact same service, regardless of the setting of that service. And reference-based pricing, on the other hand, as we just discussed, um, really sets a limit on how much the payer will pay for a particular medical service, whether you know, that is being then at a site-neutral um, level um, based on a reference price. So while site-neutral payments seek to eliminate the payment disparity based on setting of care, reference-based pricing is the tool that we then put in place to control the costs by setting a limit on what we will pay for that particular service. So these two payment methodologies, um, which are you know, innovative and have been proven to reduce spend, um, can absolutely be used together um, to promote a more efficient and cost-effective healthcare delivery model. Um, so that's, that's really it for me, sort of setting the stage, and I'm going to turn it over to the star of the show, um, Marilyn, to discuss the Montana model, and there will definitely be time after, um, you know, for questions and discussion. Marilyn, over to you. You're on mute, Marilyn. You know, I was going to say, Chris talks about being an attorney and don't throw things at the screen. Well, I'm an accountant, so don't fall asleep, okay? Because we tend to bore everyone. Chris, could you do the slideshow for me or Mark? I don't seem to be able to see how to bring it up. Maybe I do not have it teed up, Mark, do you? Oh, did it come up? I'm seeing something coming up right now. Is Let mine coming it. up? Uh, I do see that um, while well, somebody is a presenter. I think I am. Is is my slideshow up? Not yet. Oh. Ms. Portland, it looks like we're looking at your screen. It says, I think this is your screen. Do you have this screensaver? Can you see the screensaver? Oh, darn. I went ahead and stopped sharing. Mar Marilyn, it's Vicki. I don't want to interrupt you, but um, <laughs> hi, folks. Um, I'm with Nashpee, so I can maybe help Marilyn a little bit. You're, see how on the top it says Teams? you got to go to your apps and pull up the PowerPoint. I hit, I'm on share. 
and just pulled up my I pulled up yeah. PowerPoint. There you go. Is and it up? Now you got to just go to the file, whatever it, it is, probably. Um, or you can go to share and go to Windows. If it's up on your screen in a window, you can do that too. You guys but. make this sound so easy. I seem to be able to do this in Zoom, but I have a heck of a time when I try to do it in Teams. All different. Frustratingly so. I really apologize. I know all your time is so limited, and then I seem to have a difficult time. Mark with... or Marilyn, if you want to send me those slides in an email, I can put them up on the screen for you. Great. That's so great. Mark, do you have them handy, the email I sent, or I can send the email? Why don't you, I, I don't know if I have the most current version, Marilyn. Well, great, I will definitely send it. And again, I apologize. No, no apology needed. Um, I should have thought of this beforehand and asked for these so we could do it. So I, I apologize to you. Um, I should have thought of this before and I didn't. Um, so Ms. Bartlett, do you have um, Kristen Lajeunesse's email by chance? Yes, I do. Okay, great. Send it to that email. Yeah, that would be wonderful, yeah. Okay. I apologize. I'm actually with my sister. We're on a little bit of a trip at this condo in Lake Tahoe, and um, which we just got about a foot of fresh snow last night. So I truly do apologize that it's not going quite like I thought. And we can see your screen still. You might want to unshare your screen, Marilyn. This is Susan. Okay, Nothing you. like 10 people sharing ideas with you. <laughs> <laughs> you are so great. And I think there are very, very probably jealous people from Vermont who would like to be skiing in that snow, believe it or not. Oh, great. Well, I think you're probably right. Okay, so I need to stop sharing. And I think that happened, and I so apologize. I have very slow internet connection, it appears. It's okay, it's giving uh, a couple board members time to book tickets to Lake Tahoe for the season. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, come on up. <laughs> I, I switched my... Um... Marilyn, it's Chris. I switched my computer so that I now have access to be able to, if I, somebody could allow me to share, I can pull the slides up. Great. And how do we allow Chris to share? Can you do that, Susan? Is that, yeah. Oh, there we go. Oh, cool. Got it. Gosh, see, we got to have the lawyer do this, not the account. <laughs> All right, you guys let me know when you see. We On my end, it shows I'm presenting. We see a serene scene of a river surrounded by, it's not the Colorado because it looks full, but it kind of <laughs> looks like the Colorado. You got it yet? My, my screen shows I'm, I'm sharing the. It, it looks like you are, but I don't see a PowerPoint presentation. Okay. If it's <clears throat> nothing yet, my screen shows that I'm sharing and the PowerPoint is pulled up. So we definitely see your screen. It has um, this picture of this river surrounded by mountains and trees, and but there is no PowerPoint presenting. It, I think. Hmm. Let's see. Hold on. Kristen, do you by chance have it? Because it might be easier if you just do it, Kristen. Not yet. Okay. 
Why don't I send Kristen what I have? That'd be great. I'm just having really internet connection problems, but I think I could. That's so strange on my yeah. end. And it is on mine because it, I didn't. Ms. Farley, why don't we do this? We can either take just like four minutes to get this sorted out, and which is totally fine. Why don't, why don't we do that? Why don't we just take five minutes? Okay. And we'll get it. It'll be easier, I think. Um, I still and, appreciate yeah. Okay, so we'll come back in, in five minutes, a little, just 1.31, and we'll call you and make sure we have it okay on our end. And I apologize for not having got this in order. We'll call you in a minute. Okay, and we'll be back in five. Chris and Susan, I just sent it to both of you. Okay, thank you. Let me know if you don't get it. Okay, we'll reconvene in five minutes. I'm so sorry. I Don't worry, don't worry about it. It's okay, this happens. This it's, happens it's, in our virtual you guys, you have to it's see okay. the red the red thing around the screen when you're sharing it when you're in teams it shows up like red around the screen if, if you're not seeing that then it's not sharing i've never been able to share in teams i am so sorry yeah. it has never worked on this chris did my uh, get through to you no not yet jeez What's crazy is like I see my desktop is sharing, but my desktop I had then the whole presentation up and it's just stuck on my screensaver, which is so strange. Susan, some, did mine get through to you? Mm -mm, I didn't see it. I just checked. Um, if somebody could send your slides to Kristen Laduness, that would be the best course of action. Okay, I'm going to do that right now. I, I just sent them, Chris, uh, 126. Kristen Legionas, why don't you just let us know when you receive them? Will do. Thank you. Susan, you didn't get mine either? Mm -mm. My God, what the heck's going on? I sent. Oh, uh, wait, I just uh, I have it now. It's oh, okay. through. Okay, I'll, and Kristen received it too. So we have yep, a copy of the it. slides. I don't know if they're final, final, but. I just sent it all, so. Okay. So we'll take what you sent, Marilyn, when Kristen gets that. And we have backup from Mark. <laughs> it seems like everything's going to work out, but it reminds me, I had the same trouble one time doing a presentation in Teams, and I had to change the view, the PowerPoint view. I had it in presenter mode, and for some reason, if you have two screens, sometimes it, it gets messed up. Ah. So I just reverted to the mode where I build slides and and that worked better. And I don't know why, and I can't promise that it helped oh. now, but <laughs> the the view, the, the mode of PowerPoint um, seems to make a difference sometimes. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah, try. But sometimes the gods are just finicky. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, I really liked your comments on site neutrality, and, and I thought that was the clearest explanation I've ever heard of bringing the two together, because even with site neutrality, how do you know how to set the price? Yep. 
Yeah. So uh, they're really two sides of a coin. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I really but appreciate reality means nothing if the price is yeah. set at, you know. So just to report on the um, internet action here, we <laughs> received Mark's copy, but apparently we haven't seen your we haven't seen yours come through, Marilyn. It should be the same, um, right, Marilyn? Did is you it, and we'll just use Mark's copy. Yeah, use mine. That's it's, fine. It's Whatever. close enough. Yeah, they're close enough. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. I just yeah. received Marilyn's. Give me two okay. seconds. <laughs> okay. Thank Why you, things Kristen. are slow, but we are going to cross the country. I guess That's I can't. That's right. Be in a snowstorm. No, I should have put it in a balloon and sent it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was probably incorrect. <laughs> we got a lot of rain here. Might not have made it. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah, you got snow. We got rain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There we go. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Kristen, I'm so, I really appreciate it. And I appreciate you taking care of the slides. So just let me know when you want me to start talking about them. I'm ready when you are. Okay, and everybody's back online. I think it looks like we have everyone. Yes, okay. please, please hey. go ahead. I'm sorry about that. So the issue was um, you're on MacBooks and I guess it doesn't work well with Teams, so. Um, it looks like it's working well now, though. So please, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for saying that because you have solved my dilemma. I I am on a Mac. And <coughs> it does not work. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Well, thank you so much for inviting us to present. And Mark, it's it's been a pleasure working with you and knowing you over these last couple three years. So and Chris too, but. I want to talk a little bit about reference-based pricing, and our focus has always been that it's got to be driven by data. So you're going to see how we did this in Montana and that it was driven by data. Next slide, please. So what happened in Montana was in uh, uh, early 2015, I, have, I was recruited to take over the plan, and my sole focus was to turn it around financially. And what you see here is the red line was the projection that the actuary gave the Montana legislature of the state employee health plan. It had just come off a year of losing 28 million and it was projected to have reserves of minus 9 million in just two years. And so I was given the directive to turn this around. So we did several things. The biggest, of course, was reference-based pricing contracts with the hospitals. We did contracts because we did not want any balance billing, knowing that when you do contract, you probably do give up some of that cost savings uh, with all Montana hospitals. We also did a transparent pass-through pharmacy benefit. We actually eliminated uh, CVS from the pharmacy chain because they would not accept our pricing. We did on-site primary care clinics. That's a was a great savings and an improvement of access and quality. But to do this, I needed a new TPA, a new PBM, a new consultant. Uh, we formed our own data warehouse and our own administration system. So the blue line shows you where we actually were in December 2017, a spread of 121 million. Uh, and this was all driven by data and pretty fast because we had to save the plan from bankruptcy. So as a result, there's been no rate increases to either the state or the members for seven years, projected through 2023. Um, state employees were able to receive pay raises. Uh, we ended up with more money in our reserves in 2017 than the Montana General Fund. So in 2017, the legislature passed a bill to take a premium holiday for the state agencies, in effect, returning $25 million to the state. And then in 2021, it was done again uh, for $27 million because the plan has remained overfunded. So uh, it really was successful financially. Next slide. So what we decided to do was... Um, 43% of our plan span were the Montana hospitals. And of that, 11, uh, on, excuse me, only 13% was the critical access hospital spend. 
87% were the 11 larger acute care hospitals. We chose Medicare price because it was a common reference to come ov overcome charge masters and difference in billing practices. Medicare is the largest healthcare payer in the world. The Medicare payments are intended to be fair through DRGs, APCs, outlier payments, et cetera. And the payments are adjusted to factors outside hospital control. So they're adjusted for wage rates, case mix severity, outlier transfer cases, teaching intensity, interest, low income shares, a variety of things. And I had read thoroughly the MedPAC report to know how those rates were set. And they're basically set to allow an efficient hospital to make a small profit up to 2%. And the reason that Medicare does that is that they want hospitals to continue to focus on cost structures and on their expenses and become more efficient. Now, the most recent MedPAC report of uh, March 2023, uh, they mar expect the margins to be uh, minus 10 percent on Medicare payments, but break even for efficient hospitals. And uh, I contacted uh, CMS to try to learn a little bit more about efficient hospitals, but they have made that data, uh, it's private. I wasn't able to access exactly their measurements, but it is in true in what we have found, many hospitals make a profit. Here in Montana, our most efficient hospital, they manage it to be able to make a profit on Medicare, and they also have high quality numbers too. Next slide. So the first thing I did was run my claims through a Medicare repricer, a year's worth of claims. And this is for the um, larger facilities. Now, uh, this shows you what they came out on the claims, what they were charging as an overall multiple of Medicare uh, for that specific hospital. And I knew my utilization patterns at these hospitals, and I knew the prices. And so we thought, okay, We've got to get this in fast. We've got to negotiate. Can we kind of target on outpatients somewhere around 225% would be our goal. But we knew that we needed to contract separately with each hospital and that some would need a glide path to be able to come down from that 611%. So there'd be all different rates, but we had a target range. Next slide. Inpatient. We had quite a variety, um, and we targeted that that particular one around 210 percent. Now, what is interesting with our strategy is we approached the fourth hospital, Hospital O and Hospital N. They're in two different cities, and uh, both of those hospitals are doing very well managing their costs, and they have the highest quality ratings too. So our strategy, once we had this data, was to come up with a template that we wanted to use for a contract. And we approached those two hospitals first because they had lower cost and higher quality. And in those negotiations, we began calling them the efficient hospitals and trying to get the others to come to that efficient range. We also made arrangements that the governor would announce our initiative when it went live on July 1st, 2000, God, I can never remember, 16, that it would, uh, he would announce an, at their hospitals and praise them. And those two hospitals helped us work on our method. Next system, or next slide. So this became our strategy. How can we take this range of 271 points? This is blended uh, inpatient, outpatient costs. How can we take that and bring that blended rate down and narrow that margin and bring those higher costs down to the lower that we knew were that were possible? And how can we do that through contracting? And the hospital association will come back and say that balance uh, that there'll be balance bills, well, there's not. We did contracting, there was no balance billing. Next slide. 
And even more important was once we got that range down, we were no longer going to be tied to that trend. Uh, the actuary put this sheet together for us. And at that point, we were calling it transparent pricing. We were not calling it reference price reference base pricing. So you'll see the dark bar is what was actually achieved in 14 and 15. And then in 16, what was projected with that annual trend the plan was experiencing. And you'll see that we brought it down, but then also you benefit as the rate is only going to go up unless the multiple is renegotiated by whatever the Medicare rate goes up. So you've got secured future savings you can count on. Next slide. Oh, I must have put that in twice, sorry. Next slide. So what came from that is the Nashby Hospital Cost Tool. And while I was working on this with our TPA and with our actuary, we um, delved really deep, not only into our own claims data, but into Medicare cost reports. Because when I sat across this table from a hospital, I needed to know, are you really losing on Medicaid? And if so, how much are you losing? Because, and I'm glad you've had your presentations on cost shift, because that's what we would hear, and um, or price shift. Uh, that's what we would hear from uh, the hospital. So I needed to know that. I needed to know what they were losing on Medicare, if they were losing. I needed to know the supplemental payments they were getting. I needed to know their other investments. So I delved into all of their Medicare cost reports and their audited financial statements so we could have real data. So from the Excel spreadsheets that I had, our uh, Excel that I had developed uh, Mathematica funded by the Arnold Foundation and then working alongside uh, Mathematica and Rice University, we developed the Medicare or the Nashby Hospital Cost Tool. It pulls on the Hic HICRIS data, which is 11 years of hospital filed Medicare cost reports. And our particular uh, application is calculates about 300 different metrics. And we have um, probably about 100 in the actual tool, but through Nashby, we can get access to all of them. So we put this together to help states and to help employers kind of have a beginning to an approach like we had used in Montana. Next slide. So some of the things that you can see, I'm uh, looking at one particular, this hospital here is UV Medical Center. And I apologize, I think I used the wrong initials than you probably use in Vermont. And uh, so one of the things we look at is operating profit. This is to provide direct patient care by the hospital. It's not going to include physician direct patient care as that is billed separately. So we're looking at operating profit. And I know the numbers are kind of small, but you can start seeing that it's been around 20%, but it dropped extensively during the COVID years and then coming back up. And a lot of that is a function of the revenue and the expenses. Now within the Medicare cost reports, any federal funding that, or state funding that came for COVID relief, such as the PRF funds, FEMA funds, whatever, are not included here. They'll be included in net income. Next slide. So this is net profit. This is the net profit margin of the hospital as they reported it. And this will include any of the federal funding that came in. It's going to include their 340B profits that they're making and several of their other uh, facilities that are right or entities that are right under the hospital. So you'll see it's up to about 7%, but you can see the range has bounced uh, quite a bit. Next slide. Now, this is interesting. This is uncompensated care. And uncompensated care, the purple line is net charity care cost. And the blue line is uninsured and bad debt. And we're showing it here as a percentage of net patient revenue. So how much revenue did that hospital take in that they had to use for the cost of uncompensated care, and it's consistently been under 
So you're going to wonder, what's that big drop in 2021? And it's actually to, they made profit because of uh, the federal uninsured pool funds that came in, the COVID uninsured pool funds. And this isn't unlike any other health system. But part of what we're using this for with different states is working on the whole area of community benefit and uh, wanting to get a real picture of the cost. So this is cost. This isn't charge master. This is cost. Next slide. Now, this is a little confusing, but we look at payer mix. This is really critical. When I was negotiating in Montana, I remember one hospital that actually went to the press and said they were losing 40% on Medicaid and the state could not do this to them. So I needed to know, what is your payer mix? How much of your payer mix is Medicaid? Because if you're losing 40% on 50% of your payer mix, is a whole different story than if your payer mix is really 9%. So I needed to know those two. You've got to weigh them together. And we have the charts that do weigh those two. This one just shows you payer mix. Then there's a chart that shows you profit loss by payer mix. And then there's a chart that weights them. So you can kind of get a feel. You need to understand that mix of what's going on with the hospital. Now, this is UV Medical Center. And again, you'll see the lower line, which is the orange, is lower, and that's your uncompensated care, basically. And then you start getting a, a view of Medicare. It's It looks like Medicaid's been running under 15%. But then I, I like watching what's happening with Medicare and MA plans, because as you see, MA plans become more uh, the market, you see the decrease in the Medicare, and con consistently you're going to see commercial is the highest. But you need to kind of get a feel, and every hospital is going to be different, and getting a mix of that. Next slide. So one thing to do, you really should be looking at is the cost to charge ratio, and we frequently hear hospitals say we're doing great at lowering our cost to charge ratio, but what does that mean? Because there's two components to it. It's if charges uh, go up because it's the dominate denominator, your cost to charge ratio is going to come down. So that's not always a really positive thing. So we urge you to look at both sides of it. And if you look at the chart on the right, you'll see that blue is the operating costs. Now, the operating costs of this facility have been going up faster than I typically see. And we can get you the medians for different states, the medians for different size hospitals, et cetera. But this one, uh, that blue line is showing a little more tra trajectory than we usually see. But then the yellow line is showing you what is happening with charges. So I use this chart a lot to say to insurance companies, why am I going to pay a discount off a charge? I would much rather pay a cost plus and then get more knowledgeable on what those costs are. Um, to pay an arbitrary discount off of basically a made up charge number never made sense to me as an accountant. Next slide. So now we're getting into some labor metrics, and I just throw this out there as an example of things to be looking at. With COVID, we started hearing um, hospitals talking about the high cost of contract labor and labor costs going up now. So we needed to figure this out. So we delved more into the Medicare cost reports, and we've separated costs out by direct patient care. Now, this does not include direct physician patient care. It will include the 24-7 uh, doctors, physicians that are in um, intensive care units or emergency care units. And then overhead will be hospital uh, uh, dietary maintenance. Administration, they do lump executive management and admin together. And then home office. And then we're also able to split these out by is it contracted or is it um, hospital staff? And in looking at this with everybody's data, I'm amazed at contracted administration. We see rates up to $500 an hour. And uh, so then you dig into, well, who owns that contracted agency? And that, that's been interesting too. So what happened when pulling all this data together, we only put direct patient care charts and data out on the hospital cost tool. We've got some 
deeper research projects underway. We're looking at FTEs, staffing ratios. Um, we're looking at contract versus staff executive comp, and we're working very in depth with two specific states, Department of Labor, uh, Mathematica, and Rice to get more into staffing. So that's more to come your way. Next slide. So I did look at this hospital, UV Medical Center, direct patient care. And the thing that's interesting is if you look at the slide on the left, that is the percentage direct patient care labor is a total labor cost for that hospital. Now, the green one will show you it includes contracted and uh, hospital staff. And then we've got further charts that show you the different rates and shows you the FTE counts. But then if you look on the right, this is how total labor cost has gone up. So while total labor cost has gone up dramatically, direct patient care as a percentage of it really has kind of decreased. So this is what our research projects are working on. Where, where is the bulk of the labor cost going to? Next slide. So break-even analysis is what we used in Montana and what other states are using and what has been used in conjunction with RAND numbers. And we used extensively with the recent Indiana project for their bill. But we calculate what the hospital would be required to receive in revenue to meet their expenses. We actually have four levels of break even that we calculate, but we're only showing one on the uh, online version because that is what states requested. And the one that is being used is called the commercial break even. And it's how much would you need to pay as commercial payers to cover your own patient expenses, any losses from other payers, so any shortfall for Medicare, Medicaid, any uncompensated care, and then also all Medicare disallowed costs. So Medicare will disallow costs that they feel are not directly associated with patient care. Uh, we'll pull those in, but we're also pulling in other income and other expense. So now physician direct patient services are not included in the break even because those are billed and reimbursed through other methods. Now the break even rates we calculate and we show as a multiple of Medicare rates for comparability. Next slide. So this is Vermont hospitals compared to uh, the median of Vermont uh, compared to uh, national. And you see the national line is purple. And it's interesting because most, most hospitals will level out at a point. So I'm cautious about using a break-even number for one year. You kind of need to look at that trend. Now you're gonna see it dropping over these last few years because of the large amounts that came in from the federal government to supplement payments. Now you can take a look at uh, Vermont then, it's more the pink line, and you can see it spiking up around a 160, but it had kind of leveled out coming down more close to the national average and then dropping below that national average in these recent years uh, on that. And we can look at the details of the report to see you know, reasons for that. Next slide. Now, I drilled down to 2021, but again, I say that caution you want to look at is years, and on the tool you can. This is a chart from the online tool, because I like to look at it by bed size, the break-even number for bed size. And of course, you have only one hospital in that higher range and um, that break-even point. Uh, now, it's not surprising to me that the break-even point on critical access hospitals is lower. And the reason being is that the Medicare rate that is charged to hospitals or paid by Medicare is uh, the 101% of allowable costs. It's not under the PPS or the OPPS system. It is different. And then also you can kind of follow. It depends that every state is different. There is sometimes additional funding that goes into other income for uh, these critical access hospitals. But it's interesting to look by bed size and specific hospitals if that's of interest to you. Next slide. Um, 
so this is the commercial break even for the hospital that I was presenting as an example, UV Medical Center. And of course, it's the largest hospital in it parallel, but it's coming in around the 160%. And as I dug into this a little bit more, it appears that, that their costs are rising a little faster than other hospitals. And so I did not do research into as to why or look at it deeply, but uh, that might be something I'm sure your care board is well aware of what those cost drivers are. Next slide. Oh, this is really, I thought this would be easier to understand, but it didn't. I wanted to compare uh, the hospital to Mary Hitchcock Memorial Hospital and Albany Medical Center, because these seem to be closer to you and kind of the same sort of a teaching hospital center. It was interesting that Albany has run pretty flat, uh, and I did not again go into it. I was. It, it was interesting to me that the other two, the one uh, in your neighboring state, New Hampshire, and then uh, the University of Vermont, they're up and down, up and down. There's kind of not a flatter trend, but I thought that this was a fairly uh, interesting comparison when you look at the detail of the numbers. Next slide. So the next thing I do is I go into the audited financial statements, and this is for UVHN, University of Vermont Health Network. And here um, I just summarized when it's when the audited financial statements, they will include all the holdings. So if you look on the left, there is just a lot of different holdings that this company has, or that I'm going to call it a network has hospitals nursing homes foundations imaging centers physician centers um just kind of a variety of different uh things you'll see a lot of ownership of some of these will have they have a they have a company called health network venture holdings an inventure an investment firm basically you'll see some of them will have uh management uh uh, th they'll own contracted uh, management staffing. You, you'll see a lot of that. So it's interesting to look at what the ownership is. Now, also within this ownership is UV Medical Center. And then UV Medical Center under it has these companies listed that they own these companies, a medical center condominium association, uh, executive services. I did not delve in to know what that meant, but I'm sure you know from your Green Mountain Care Board anyway, whether that's an executive service where they um, contract out management services, I'm not really sure, but that all rolls up to that one company. Next slide. So if we look at the whole big conglomerate, you can see that the whole big conglomerate of all the companies, I compared net profit margin is running like between uh, around around four, a little lower than 4%, but it's taken a big drop. And that big drop, it shows a 10% drop, but 9% of that is from unrealized investment losses. So they have a large investment portfolio and with a stock market, as we all know from our 401ks, as well as our own investments, we saw those big drops. So it's it's particularly that. So when we hear in the news of all of the losses that these big systems are experiencing, it's important to know a little more it because we are seeing increased expenses. We're seeing reduction of COVID funds. So we need to be attentive to that. Next slide. I wanted to look at their financial assets. So this is the market value on that day uh, over the years. And this is including the 240 million in unrealized investment losses that happened in 2022. And this shows you cash and cash equivalents as well as financial investments. And this is what we're consistently finding is that the level of financial investments is back to pre-COVID levels. So yes, a lot of money's been lost, but a lot of it was COVID funded money. Next slide. Um, it's interesting because uh, the Fitch, I read the bond filings because the they they have municipal bonds and the Fitch report cautioned, they said they have a highly they, ha they have a high reliance on their 340B drug program. And I 
think, you know, Green Mountain Care Board, I'm sure, looks at that closely. But I personally got stung by that, I felt, as a state of Montana plan because I was paying $5,000 for Umera for my patient or my members. But I was getting a pretty good rebate, close to $2,000. And all of a sudden, in Helena, all my rebates went away for all those patients, and I couldn't understand why. So, of course, I'm on the phone calling Abby. And they, it turns out that the hospital in Helena had become 340B, which meant I lose my rebates. So now I'm paying 5000 And as I tracked it down with the hospital, they were now considered a covered entity and they could buy that drug for three cents. So you basically have shifted that savings that you had as a health plan over to the covered entity. So I do a lot of work in the 340B program and Chris is doing a lot of work in it too. So I dug in to see what exactly are the three, why, why is Fitch saying this? And they disclosed that um, over time, uh, the system as a whole is kind of, but I carved out just the lighter green part is what the one hospital is. So 340B is something to look at. It's a funding source for hospitals too, which I'm sure you look at. And I bored everyone to death with my accounting stuff. Next slide. That's it. So I hope that it's been somewhat helpful that I, I guess my parting words would be that we were very successful in Montana in meeting our goal, improving access, but we did online centers and stuff. Um, and we've taken it to a new level of data. Um, I think any decision has to be data driven. And Chris, back to you. Chris, I think you're muted. Mark, do you want? Do you have any comments? No, I'm just uh, waiting for Chris to respond to your invitation. <laughs> um, Miss Deacon, you can just shake your head yes, yes or no if you. I'm here. Questions. Sorry, I could hear everything you were saying, and I could not locate the unmute. So I apologize. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think, you know, with that, with the Montana story and with the background on reference based pricing generally, um, you know, I don't know if, if Mark, if it's an appropriate time to open it up to discussion and questions. I think that um, Marilyn and I are prepared to, um, you know, walk through any concerns. Um, you know, we've both run major health plans and certainly understand the, the complex dynamic uh, between the hospitals, the carriers, um, government, um, and the state, all stakeholders involved in such a process. Yeah. I think questions would be Great. appropriate right now, please, if folks have them. Okay, so I think I think what we'll do is um, we have a normal process where we go through the board members first, the healthcare advocate, and then we open up to the public. Um, so we'll go in, in that direction if that's okay with you all. Um, so I'll turn it. I'll turn it to my fellow board members to go ahead and ask any questions or make any comments that they may have. I have a, a couple questions, um, basically uh, to clarify for myself. <clears throat> um, thank you, Marilyn, and thank you, Chris. Um, Marilyn, on your slide um, 18, it showed, um, and maybe our. Kristen could bring up the slides. So the break-even analysis. And with this, it, it, um, there are several places where the red um, line dips below 
100% in 2013, 2020, and 2021. Is it correct to interpret that as the hospital shown here could break even with commercial prices less than 100% of what Medicare reimburses? Yes, that's correct. And this is the median for all of the hospitals. And that's absolutely correct. And what's going to influence that quite a bit is if they're making profits on uh, Medicare. What is really influencing that also is uh, bringing in other income. And other income will include investment income. It's not supposed to include unrealized. It's only supposed to include investment income. And then um, any of the federal payments or uh, state payments that were made through COVID, any of the supplemental payments that came in, we find um, like with, uh, well, in teaching hospitals, you're gonna see a lot of funding come in supplemental for teaching facilities and that. So you're right. And probably the biggest is other income that they could make it on the Medicare reimbursement those le those times. Great, thank you. And, and I think that's, a, it's important. Um, I always need to remind myself that Medicare um, payments to hospitals um, are adjusted upward for rurality, if a hospital's rural. If a hospital is a teaching hospital, their Medicare payments are greater than if a non-teaching hospital. If a hospital has what's considered a disproportionate share of low-income individuals, that hospital receives higher payments from Medicare. So That's Medicare is already paying more for those things. Yeah, um, and then yeah. Some initiatives on quality or they had HIT for their information. There's some different supplements coming in. Yeah, the, um, th I'm not sure which slide it was, but the slide on ownership in different companies. Yeah. Um, you may not be able to say more, but I'm interested in that. The, um, there, that one, 22. Um, Could you say more about the, um, what's the executive services company? Well, that's interesting. I picked this up from the audited financial statement. It just listed that. And I would think probably Green Mountain Care Board would have more information on exactly what that is. But it, it the audited financial statements are a wealth of information. And this showed that these five companies rolled up to that. Now, what I've seen in others, and I can't say this is it, but what I've seen on executive services is I've seen a health system own a company for executive services or management services. And then they sell their services to go manage different hospitals. And sometimes it's managing hospitals within that health system. And I typically see much higher uh, rates paid than I see across the market. So that, that's a thing to look at. You know, it may be a source where they're selling to outside and making an income, but it's it, it would be interesting to know more about that. And oftentimes, and again, I'm not speaking to Vermont specifically, but what I've seen with these executive services arrangements is um, when a hospital is either purchased or there's a merger or acquisition, the executive services contract is a way that the, um, uh, the purchasing entity or the selling entity can continue to pay some, you know, if I've now, I'm no longer the CEO, but I'm consulting to, I can now be paid um, as part of an executive services arrangement. So these are also really common in those instances when you have mergers and consolidation um, or mergers and acquisitions in hospitals. Thank you. Um, similarly, um, you made some points about the 340B program. Yes. Um, could you walk me through that again, please. I want to make sure that I understand how uh, how that works with a larger facility consolidates or acquires smaller facilities. What happens with the 340B program? 
Yes, and Chris, I'll ask you to supplement if I skip something. The basis of a 340B program is that uh, first, the hospital, let's say, well, there are several types, but let's say the hospital is registered as a covered entity. And if you're a disproportionate share hospital, a rural referral center like Cleveland Clinic, there are several categories, but the hospital is a covered entity. And if a physician is either employed or contracted under that covered entity, then any scripts that that doctor writes for what is considered an eligible patient, when an eligible patient is someone whose medical record is maintained by that entity, et cetera, then that script becomes eligible for 340B pricing wherever it is filled. So the issue there is that a health system or a hospital that purchases smaller hospitals or purchases especially physician practices and rolls them into their entity, they then become eligible to have 340B scripts from that so that you end up with... Um, that savings right across the board. And, and I, I don't know if that was clear. Chris, can you help me out there? Oh, Chris, you're on mute. I kept it easy now. No, I think you captured it, Marilyn. It's, you know, there's, uh, and the one cautionary note here is that, you know, the 340B drug program, I would say beating up on PBMs, um, state neutrality, 340B was also a hot topic in Washington. And so the reliance on the net income from the 340B drug program is, is interesting because there, there's a lot of discussion on that, um, that profit and whether or not it's being used prudently by um, or should be used by the hospitals in this manner. So I would just add that caveat that this is also a very hot topic to keep your eye on. Uh, it's <clears throat> yeah i we need to double check and and with our staff I'd, i'm just saying this to help us double check but my understanding of the program is that hospitals that qualify for the program are able to purchase medications at a pretty steep discount that's correct and then receive back full price payments. Yes. Yeah. So, so as a large hospital acquires smaller entities or private practices, it will receive discounts for purchasing the medicine, but receive full reimbursement. It's meant to help hospitals that are struggling or um, treat a disproportionate share of low-income individuals. But I don't know enough about our state yet, but around the country, um, this has led to, um, it's generated a lot of concerns with mergers and acquisitions. Is, is that a correct statement? Yeah, 100%. And I mean, just to give a very concrete example, I think Everybody on the call likely knows um, the cost of Humira and what that's cost the country in terms of um, for health plans and, and payers. Um, Humira can be purchased by a 340B covered entity um, for about three cents a month, right? And, then, and that much. drug is being charged um, at full price often to the commercial payers um, and the spread between the three cents a month and the Full price of Humira is is being kept by the hospitals. Essentially, sometimes it is, you know, to provide um, disproportionate, um, you know, because they're in a low income community, other providing additional benefits or uncompensated care. But I think we know again, as mergers and consolidation have sort of eaten up um, a lot of these smaller entities, uh, that's not always the case. Uh, thank you. Uh, one final thing. Um, We've talked about reference-based pricing. An uh, earlier speaker, um, Chris Whaley from RAND, 
you, I think you might be familiar with him. He talks about caps, and I think it's um, there. It, it's similar. Um, I'm wondering if you've heard of or seen places set different reference prices for primary care versus specialty care in a sense to incentivize primary care providers to move to a state. If the reference, the overall reference for payments to, ho to hospitals was set at 175, 175% of Medicare, have you seen any any place or do you know any reason why we could not try having 175 for one set of providers and 200 for primary care? Yeah, um, I will just, and I think I've got this right. When I did this in Montana and I said it all differently, we did this, I just showed you what we did with hospitals. But with providers, we did run those claims through, and Montana was really low on what we were paying. And we increased primary care providers to 165% of Medicare. We gave them a big bump. And then uh, we went ahead and left that same pricing for those within the health system for the direct for the pharmacy or I mean excuse me for physician services so we did increase that and we did but we did that specialty and primary both but you raise a good point and I know other purchasers have considered it also um, in the behavioral health space because uh, in order to make the network more accessible the network can't pay behavioral health specialists you know, pennies on the dollar for what their time is worth. And so yeah. increasing that rate. Um, so, but other states have also not just reference based, but, you know, they set investment targets for primary care. And, you know, we need to spend at least 10% of our spend on primary care. Those types of models exist as well. Yeah. So this type of model can, um, there can be a lot of flexibility in it. Yeah, I think so definitely. And what we did was we then took a lot of our savings we were getting and really put it into our on-site health centers. We had five across the state that served 73% of our members, and that was our primary care home. And that we put uh, that that's where referrals occurred. And then we did contracts with those health centers at 125% of Medicare for independent standalone radiology, ultrasound lab with independent groups. So that became our primary care center. Thank you very much. Um, member Merman or Holmes, do you have any questions or comments? I can go for a few. Oh, thank you all so much for these presentations. Really, really interesting topics. Um, we often talk about Vermont being sort of an exceptionally different state as far as the healthcare landscape, both within our hospitals, primary care, competition, our rurality. Um, I imagine you might have hear, heard some of that about Montana. I was just wondering if you could sort of describe the the landscape of hospitals and hospital competition in Montana. Oh, certainly I'd be glad to. We have 11 acute care hospitals. Of course, we're a very, very large state with uh, our population's a million, but our land mass is amazing. So we have 11 acute care short-term hospitals and 48 critical access hospitals. But I think when we delved into it, we saw that the 48 critical access hospitals were only 13% of our 43% spend. So it was not that large. And as we delved in there, we looked at our utilization and we looked at the location and we looked at the services and we negotiated with those facilities. We actually, uh, probably about four of them, we raised the rates that we were paying. Three of them, we lowered the rates because they were actually owned by 
the larger hospitals and had turned more into referral centers and charging high rates. So we lowered them and monitored them. One, we didn't even make any change because we were paying 10,000 a year to them. And every time we tried to get a hold of them, the controller was out haying or taking care of the cows. So, you know, we couldn't really get with them. But um, uh, we did uh, immediately legislatively, because this was a state employee health plan, um, every one of the rural areas had a legislator. And the hospital association was very vocal that you're going to lose your critical access hospital, the state's going to make you go broke, etc. So we worked very closely with the legislature. That was my job. And I reported to them quarterly and to one group of the rural areas monthly on what we were doing with specific negotiations and pull them in. Uh, for Montana, uh, our critical access problem, uh, hospitals weren't our problem. They were being uh, funded fairly well. Uh, they were going through different transitions. What was a problem for us were those that were being purchased by the larger hospitals. Now, we don't have a teaching hospital in Montana. We have uh, 11 acute care hospitals. The major health systems were Sisters of Charity of Leavenworth and Providence. And then uh, about four were independent. And with the health system ones, those were the harder negotiations. And... Uh, they were concerned about this moving across state lines. But um, I think uh, we probably had some of the similar things uh, legislatively or politically would be the same. And I would, my only advice would be look at each hospital separately stand alone and what your, what the utilization was, but even then more the financial picture. Chris, do you have some to add to that? <laughs> no, and I wasn't on mute. Um, uh, I just wanted to make sure. Uh, no, I don't have anything to add. I think that there are similarities, but there's also a recognition that no state is the same and that this is can be a very flexible approach um, that can be targeted and shaped um, directly to your market and to your, your very unique needs as a state. I agree. And no matter what what option you choose, whatever thing you do, I really can't speak enough about how much we learned by looking at hospital costs and hospital expenses. Not focusing on the revenue, but what we learned by getting into the expenses, 340B, mergers and acquisitions. I know it's painful, but getting into that level of detail was really critical for us. Thank you for that. Um, when you talk about the commercial break-even point, um, I think if we put up any of those slides, you know, it's some 120, 140, 160 percent of Medicare spend would be the commercial break-even point. But yet, uh, I think in Vermont. Where, where are we, about 225% or, or more of Medicare spend as our, our average? Um, what, what is it, Tom? 215. 215. What's the gap? Because that's a lot more than a 2% margin. What What is 215? What was that? Oh, our, our, average, uh, our average Medicare uh our commercial rates are about 215 percent of medicare over the overall in the state so what's the difference between that 140 160 percent and that 215 percent of medicare where's that money going well our break even is what the hospital would need to break even um with the rates there i would say you'd have to look at what else the hospital is spending the money on or whatever they're acquiring. Right. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I mean, I think it's the it's the question of the day, right? Or, you know, the year. Um, what, where, why is there a need to charge 250 or 215 when you're, you could break even at 140, account for a healthy margin, even at 10%, we still have a delta. And I think um, if you look at some of the larger systems that are driving that higher rate, the commercial rate at 215, 250, 300, 
um, you'll probably, you know, drive down any highway and you'll see some some building occurring. You might see some new wings. You might see some, um, uh, you know, really renovations, big new machines that need to be fed. Um, so I, I think that uh, it's a cynical answer, but it's the right one. Um, you have to look and see where they're where they're spending their money. Um, uh, that might not necessarily be the most efficient use. And I think a lot of it's going to that consolidation. I That's a good point, Chris. And I think our, our focus with break even was we were saying, we're not saying a hospital should break even, but that spread is room for negotiation or room for really kind of figuring out what to do there. But I think you're right, going to mergers and consolidations, lots of money going that direction. Do you, when you look through the NASHP database, do you find hospitals that are um, successful and thriving with high quality and, you know, good access at those 100% Medicare break-even levels? Yeah, we do. Is it, is it common? I have not looked at it massively. I usually look at the uh, states, you know, uh, because what I what 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 our tool is is looking at the break even. But when I bring in the RAND information, is when I can start seeing those spreads and should they be? Yeah, you know, I've got one in Montana. Like I said, that their goal was to make a profit on Medicare. They are efficient and their quality is high. So I, I do see that. Um, it's interesting. And when you read, read the MedPAC report, well, if you were a boring accountant, you'd read the MedPAC reports. But um, when you read those and you look at their methodology and what they're looking at and what they consider an efficient hospital, uh, you start getting a feel for what things a hospital could be doing to become more efficient. And uh, that's eye-opening. Mm -hmm. But I think I, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to dig in. Okay. And I think there is some data that one of your fellow members has done here, Tom, that is taking a look at that that specific question you're asking. Yeah. Well, um, thank you, Marilyn. It's I'm not an accountant, but I also like MedPAC reports. It's the easiest 600 page report I ever read. Um, they're they're long, but once you get used to them. They're repetitive, and there's a lot to lot to learn. Um, the thing that interests me, Dave, that builds on your question is what proportion of hospitals across the U.S. could break even with commercial rates less than or equal to 100% of Medicare? And that number, according to the NASHB cost tool, is about 39% of hospitals in the U.S. Many of them have outstanding quality measures. Mm -hmm. the, the, the one other question that I, I wanted to ask you is, um, I, I'm not quite sure if I understand with the 340B reliance, how that adversely affects the commercial insured uh, patients. C could you... Uh, you're the one I'm asking about, so yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> I sure can answer that one. How it adversely affects is that the commercial pay person, whether it's the employer health plan or the insurance plan, they're paying the full cost. So where I used to be paying in that situation I gave you, I would be paying about 3000 for Humira because I paid the 5000 but I got a rebate. So net of my 2000 rebate, roughly, I was paying 3000 and doing just fine. But once that hospital became 340B and they owned most every physician in the town, then every single, and this was Helena, Montana, where 60% of the state employees lived and retirees too, then all of a sudden, I lost my rebate on all of those. And I was paying 5000 for every single one. And so what I had to and do. Your rebate was from the pharmaceutical company or yeah. you, mm -hmm. a direct and, rebate? Okay. Yeah. 
and ph pharmaceutical company cannot give a rebate on a 340B drug. And why would they? They're selling it for three cents. They're not going to give me 2000 And then, um, yeah, it hurts the commercial markets seriously. There's also some studies about out there about questioning some of the um, – uh, types of drugs. There, with the 340B program, there's definitely the incentive for a prescriber to prescribe a 340B drug, knowing that that big savings is coming back to the hospital. Would there be other drugs that maybe could suffice that are not 340B? And I am not in the pharmacy area. I have just read the studies, so I can't really speak to that. Chris? No, I think that you're right. I mean, I, we've I've read studies, um, I believe um, Harvard conducted a study where this exact phenomenon was observed, and that was when the price of the medication um, dropped and fell off of the 340B list, um, the prescribing patterns went like nose dove when it made it on the list and the price for all the other commercial plans was higher it was on a 340 bit, 340B list, prescribing patterns went way up. So it is, it's a real phenomenon and um, something that we should be, you know, very concerned about and cautious of. I thank you guys so much. I That's all the questions I have for now, but I, I really appreciate the, the, uh, the presentation and you coming here and, and interrupting your vacation to do it. So. Ooh, this is great. It's great thank talking you. with you. Thank you so much. I just had a quick question. Um, I know we have, I want to make sure Owen also has some time and healthcare advocate and others to ask questions, but I'm just wondering um, in Montana or in other states where this has been uh, implemented, as the, as the caps are put into place or as these reference-based prices are put into place, I'm assuming that the relative prices of services will shift potentially depending upon how close they were initially to the reference-based price cap. Um, so I'm just wondering, are, is there been any evidence of reallocation of resources, shifts in service delivery mix, anything like that in response to changes basically in the prices that, um, you know, are being uh, charged under the new system? I really don't have a response for that. Now, ours was not necessarily cap ours was a full price so we no matter what the service was it was a multiple of that um uh, i do know that the oregon plan the oregon state employee health plan uh put in the cap and they have a cap i believe of 100 Eighty percent if it's out of network, two hundred percent in network, and they would be a good source to find that out from. I really don't know. And then Indiana, uh, we'll see if this law passes. What happens there? There are several other employer health plans in different markets that have done the cap route, and I am not as uh, knowledgeable on that. Chris, yeah, I would just say, uh, like with Oregon um, and certainly Indiana. Um, even though they might, well, Oregon happened a couple years ago, we haven't seen, in my, um, to my knowledge, empirical studies that are looking at utilization shifts. I think you'd have to be at least a couple years out from a claims experience perspective to start to look at that and figure that out. But, I mean, it's a great question, and I hope one that, um, you know, the researchers that are smarter than me are looking at. Great. Okay, thank you. That was my question. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a couple quick ones. First, I really thank you guys. This was extremely informative, and all these roundtables have opened my mind to a lot of things that it wasn't before. And Ms. Bartlett, your name and reputation have been something I've been hearing a lot about since I got here eight months ago. Yeah. And um, so I was really excited to have you here today, and thank you for doing it, because you are a star in the Nash P world, and so I appreciate <laughs> you doing this for us. It's extremely helpful. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> My my first and biggest question is, what are the downsides? You go first. Well, okay, I I can give you the little technical downsides. 
uh, that some of the downsides when you put this in, I can give you lessons learned, but that's probably not what you're asking for. Lessons learned are um, Medicare doesn't have great um, uh, rate setting for maternity or pediatrics. Um, so we kind of got stung on that. And so we went back and I've seen a couple of employer plans on certain codes, uh, price them as a multiple of Medicaid. Uh, that was just lessons learned. Um, I would say um, we then were paying a multiple of Medicare for the J codes, which are the infusibles. And uh, we had a lot of pushback from the hospitals. They felt that was an area that we were coming in way, way, way low. So we did a deep dive on the pharmaceutical prices. What were the infusibles that actually were considered 340B outpatient? And what were the rebates the hospitals were? And, and we had to do a lot of work in that arena to prove that we were not going to change it. So minor more lessons learned. But as far as I was concerned about uh, shift to the private sector. What was going to happen? Because uh, so when I when we first started doing this, we approached the Montana Association of Healthcare Purchasers, which is private and public large payers, large companies, and I wanted to do it through them. As the state of Montana health plan, the Montana purchasing rules did not allow me to contract directly with hospitals. I had to find an intermediate area to be able to do that. So I thought, gee, if we could get all those contracts in this purchasing coalition, then anyone, Washington Corp, Northwestern Energy, anybody could get into these contracts. But I wasn't ready for the heavy hit of the lobby of brokers and insurance carriers that had those large employer plans and did not want this. So they voted not to participate. So then I was concerned, is there going to be an issue that it, the private employers are going to come back or others? Now, the Montana Association of Counties and the Montana Cities Group, their payment plans followed what I did. They didn't want to do it when we did it but they liked what they saw. So they both have moved to reference-based pricing, both these, the teachers, or not teachers, the county and the city workers with great success, their, their trusts have. Um, we have seen two private employers move to this, but I didn't hear any pushback from any private, but that was one concern I had. Uh, Oregon was just recently asked if that had happened. And the state of Oregon said they have not received any feedback on it. But those were some things, considerations. I think for me, it was a political um, battle because this was a state employee health plan and taxpayer dollars. And uh, I had heavy, heavy lobby from the hospital association and insurance association that that was one. But Chris, can you help out with this? Sure. Question? Yeah, I mean, I think the common um, the common arguments you're going to hear against reference-based pricing are that it's a cost containment strategy that shifts rather than addresses cost and shifts to the patient and the provider, which I think, you know, for the reasons in the, in the hospital cost tool and showing the break even, um, I, I think that doesn't hold water. And the way that you can pull off reference-based pricing, it's not a monolith. There are different ways to do it. You can do it without, absolutely without shifting any cost to the member, um, so that's one. Um, I think another argument that you'll hear, and certainly this is an argument that the American Hospital Association has made against reference-based pricing, is that it doesn't take quality into account um, when it, uh, you know, when it sets a, when we set a price, right? Um, but I always sort of push back and I say, well, we don't really take quality into account now when we have these broad provider networks, you know, whether it's for the Blue, United, Cigna, or Aetna. Um, so normalizing price will actually allow us to also look at, look at quality, but um, certainly it's not something that we're taking away from quality. We're, we're, we're solving for an issue and we can also include quality metrics. Again, it can be flexible on how you do this. Another, um, 
uh, pain point um, that the lobby often brings up is uh, that the, the information that consumers and purchasers need in order to navigate a reference-based pricing world are not available yet. I think that that argument could have held water three years ago, but um, today in light of the hospital transparency rule, the transparency and coverage rule, and all of the new data that's been made available as a result of the Consolidated Appropriations Act and some of the, the, the rules that have been put in place of transparency, that argument just doesn't hold up anymore. The tools exist um, and, and we as a country have you know, sort of indicated that that's a direction we wanna head in with transparency. And then finally, I, I think one of the broadest arguments um, and sort of a stretch, but that I've heard made um, in multiple venues is that uh, shifting to a, a total like focus on lower cost will um, limit a hospital's ability to do all of the other things that its mission statement says it does, right? So training the workforce, conducting research, caring for under and under uninsured, and, um, you know, doing the community work that, you know, hospitals like to, to do and, and say they do. Um, but again, you know, whether those dollars should be spent to have a hospital redeploy them with a food bank versus, you know, keeping money out of that system in order to, you know, address those social ills, like that's a policy decision of who you want to be in charge of allocating those resources. Is it a hospital? Is it a different state agency? Um, that's a policy call, but it is an argument that is um, often made against a cost containment strategy that looks to, to reduce um, price and cost. That's really helpful. Um, you know, when the board has made cuts in the hospital budgets in the past, there's been concern about um, hospitals having to respond by limiting services. And I think if we were to implement in Vermont, the program that you're proposing, uh, you know, 165, 185% of Medicare, there'd be a lot of money out of the hospital system potentially. And that would be potentially a large cut. And I guess the concern we would have is how do we do that without causing disruption such that the hospital's finances are um, not sustainable or two, that they have to go and cut services because I don't think we want that. So I guess the question is sort of jumping off what Dr. Merman asked, how can you make it more affordable without those downside consequences of removing services or really harming hospitals' financial sustainability. So if I might, if I might offer a thought, and that is that today, and as you looked at Maryland's, like you know, the labor numbers that were put up there, one of the areas that these hospitals have had to grow um, from a cost perspective is administrative costs, right? for every, is there's some statistic out there, like for every physician, they need four billing administrative professionals to deal with the carriers and the negotiations and the price and all the rest of it. But when you have a price, right? When it's clear and transparent of what that price is, there's a lot of administrative waste that can be cut out of a system and that those funds can be redeployed to reinvest back into the hospitals. And I think we need to be very clear that the goal of, reference-based pricing is absolutely not to um, you know, drive hospitals out of business. It is to provide incentives to both make them more efficient, um, but also not to give away, whether it's a commercial payers um, funds, taxpayer funds, et cetera. Um, and it's a starting point for a conversation. It can be phased in. Um, you know, we all know that we need our hospitals and we need the folks in our hospitals. Um, the question is, do we need them to maintain our nonprofit hospitals to maintain a 15% operating uh, or profit margin, right? Probably not. Chris, that's well said. I think that um, what we did was a hospital saying, I'll have to cut services. Well, we really got into the numbers. We were really able to get into uh, using Medicare cost reports. We really looked at their different costs. Uh, what what we found in some cases is very very high lab costs, and the hospital owned the lab. And so we 
started asking, unfortunately for us, we had to really get into the detail. So I would just say that um, the hearing the concern is very, very important, but then delving into the substance of the concern is equally important to really validate that what services would have to be given up and why. But when you start getting into the cost, like Chris said, um, you know, with one particular we were working with, and and it's it's the hospital strategy call. It certainly isn't mine to make, but it was good to, we were able to get into a little bit more detail of what was being spent for community benefit. And should a hospital spend 1.2 million on billboards? Maybe, maybe so, but those are questions where like you as a care board, you know, what what is being, get into the detail of what the expenses are. One of the great things about Vermont amongst so many, if you ask anyone from Vermont, is we do not have billboards in this wonderful yes. city. <laughs> oh my gosh, I love it. It's a, it's a trade-off for our crummy weather. Oh my God, I would take it any day. Oh Same my here. goodness, that's wonderful. But yeah, because to me that was like, is that a community benefit or is it advertising? But it was considered community benefit to educate the public on doctors and services. and up. So, so there's a lot of really dis interesting dialogue they had. Oh, I love that in Vermont. I want to move there. You're welcome to. We need people, but we don't have that many houses. So <laughs> um, one last question question I had was um, Vermont is studying and evaluating and working towards global budgets. What is the role, if any, in reference-based pricing and designing and thinking about global budgets or actually having global budgets, if any? I would, um, and again, there's a whole section of Nashby and Vicky's on this call and maybe can answer. I don't work on the global budget side, but one thing I had been been thinking about is when you set a global budget, how do you set it? Do you set it according to the expenses? Or are you setting it according to revenue? Or, or maintaining it? It's how do you set a global budget? What do you base that on? That's all my, the, my only limited knowledge, and there are Nashby resources much more knowledgeable about global budgets but when i've looked at what other states have done or cost growth benchmarks whatever i always question where did you, what was your starting point yeah i mean i i would just very simply put when you sit down to write a household budget you know you list out the things that are you know what does it cost me to do this what does it cost me to do this and and i know that's very simplistic but at the end of the day until you understand um, those inputs, it's very difficult to get to a principled um, and uh, sustainable number for a global budget. Thanks. And comparing those input costs, analyzing those, comparing them to others, are they reasonable or are they not? You know, I think I like the, I'd never thought of using the word input. That's absolutely right. Thank you, lawyer. That's really helpful. Um, so thank you guys very, very much. And I'll turn it to the healthcare advocate for any questions or comments that they may have. Uh, so, Go ahead, Eric. Oh, uh, just a, or at least for me, a, a quick comment and a question. I think your the slide about the corporate structure, Marilyn, was really, oh, it's always a pleasure to see you again. It's great uh, to see you, Eric. <laughs> I'm kind of jealous about all the snow you have. Um, <laughs> So uh, we were, I was happy to see or interested to see the slide about the corporate structure of the health network. Just we are um, currently working with Nancy Kane uh, at the Harvard Chan School to look into the structure and the flows of monies within the health network. And I look forward to having a robust discussion with board staff about the findings and you know, whether uh, presenting them to the board or talking uh, with staff or however we decide to do it, I think it's um, useful. She's been super helpful in the Massachusetts and the regulation of MassHealth. 
Um, so it's really it's a field leading analyst that we she have access to. Is, and not to interrupt you, but she did um, was the principal author of Nashby's uh, financial uh, model legislation with and really used audited financial statements. So you've really got great research. I'm glad yeah. you're doing that. Anxious to see what you learn. Um, and, and the other question, I guess this is really a question for, for you and Chris, Marilyn, is how do you see reference-based pricing in the Nashby tool being applicable, not just to um, negotiation, say, of ERISA plans, self-funded plans, but also to regulation and uh, state involvement? Because you've talked a little bit about your experience negotiating the Montana plan, but how that translates over to regulation, I think, would be helpful to understand. Thank you. Certainly. A um, couple of things that uh, we have seen happen. One is we've had hospitals come and work with us and say, wow, I didn't come out very good on that. How can I? Yeah, I mean, we've had very few, but we've had some hospitals want to become better in that realm. But we've been working with states directly on regulation, and we've been working with um one state in particular, we did a lot of analysis of pre and post merger and uh, pre and post acquisition and what happened with costs and what happened with revenue, what happened with break even. We've done a lot of that type of work. We've had uh, one particular, well, two particular states that are looking at public option plans and how would they price them that we have done supplemental work for. We have worked with um, a little bit from behind the scenes on some, like I mentioned, uh, we haven't had a lot of uptake, but if a state is looking at, uh, uh, Vicki, who's on the call right now, is working with one particular state that wants to really understand the cost structure more. They're the only one I've seen this one state that Vicki's working with that really wants to know that more before they move into any kind of a global budget or cost growth benchmark. So they're using a lot of the data from the tool to kind of understand that. Um, Indiana, we were critical, of course, with uh, doing all the analysis to support their move to capping the prices. Uh, Chris, you've been working yeah. with us on this. I would say what's key from a regulatory perspective um, that we should be looking at is ensuring that there is a environment that is that makes this information like the cost information, the financial, the ownership structure more available so that when you know, because if we then have an environment in which we're able to see this information, of course, it makes sense to pay this price as opposed to one plan paying a hospital $5,000 for the same service that they're paying 50 that the same, you know, the variability, um, uh, you know, is, is so great. But again, I think the regulatory environment um, is really important, not necessarily um, regulating or dictating in a prescriptive manner thou shalt engage in reference-based pricing. But there's a, there's a huge role to be played in making an environment that makes this makes sense. And, and when I say this makes sense, it's really you know, more reasonable and fair and transparent pricing um, and a, a less information asymmetry for purchasers. That's a good point, Chris, and that really kind of sums up, which I wish I would have phrased differently, was that really states are using the data and the, the data is what's being used in multiple different ways, not just to do reference-based pricing, but to really gain more knowledge of, of transparency. Thank you so much. Sam, do you have any questions? Yeah, I'm glad we have our matching HCA uniform, unofficial uniforms on, Eric. Um, thank you, Marilyn and Chris. This is a really wonderful and important presentation. And I want to echo what Eric said about the importance of using audited financial information. I think it's critical. And I, um, so I just was wondering if the two of you could talk about how you think about measuring operational efficiency at a hospital. I know there are a lot of different metrics in the literature. I'm curious of how you think about that. Um, and in your work and what you would recommend at the board and how the board think about it. 
I have not really studied it that much. Now you'll enjoy this. When we contacted CMS, I wanted to know the metrics and what they were studying, what they were looking at to declare somebody an efficient hospital. How are they calculating it? Because it wasn't cost only. It was a lot of different metrics. And it was interesting because I was able to talk to, this first came out in their 2011 report, I believe it was, was the first they talked about efficiency. And so I talked to one of the members of the team that really came up with that and is still with the group. And uh, he would not share the information with me. Perhaps you could get that. He said that they were going to make it public, but then they realized that they were going to get slammed by hospitals and saying, well, I'm efficient, you shouldn't measure it this way or you should. So they keep that information private, but it's been pretty um, accurate. So I, I have not really looked at that. We've compared different costs for different uh, procedures. Uh, we've looked at different unit costs for lab services. So we've done some cost stuff, but the true essence of efficiency I haven't worked on. Chris? Yeah, nor have I, um, but I would so sort of echo Marilyn's concern or sentiment that it would be really nice. You know, this is one of those areas where having the key to the test might be a really good thing for the market. <laughs> But the, the problem, the, therein lies the problem, right, is if you were to make that public, the agency would have to have a backbone of steel and the politicians behind them to say, I'm not going to now capitulate to the industry and the lobby on what they want the metrics to look like. And I don't know that we live in a world where that is the case today. Thank you. Great. Um, and one of the things we do next is we take public comment. Um, and so I'll open it up to that. And if anyone has any questions, just use the raise your hand function. Um, the first hand up is Mr. Ham Davis. Please go ahead. Mr. Chairman, uh, just a comment first. Uh, I think that what's missing, what seems to be missing from all of this is the whole question of volume. Um, and that cost is obviously important, but volume is huge, and it's especially in Vermont where the, the, the volumes have been so so widely variable. And so the question really to me is how, how you play, you, you put that factor in. It's, a, it's being done nationally in a sense by, on the one hand, stacking up Wenberg's very small area variation data against a, a different kind of system, which doesn't worry so much about volume, which is uh, being picked up by CMMI, by Arlene Ash of UMass Worcester. Um, but in any event, my, my personal feeling is, having watched UVM, this, the system for a long time, that the chairman's on the money. You put this system into Vermont, it's not going to work. Um, the second thing I would have is, uh, the second thing I'd, I have a question for Marilyn and Chris. I did a, I've done a lot of research in the Pacific Northwest, and I especially based around UW Seattle. And yeah, they they used to, back in the day they ran something called the Whammy States, where because Washington was had vastly greater vastly greater resources, especially in the Seattle area, um, than uh, than uh, or than uh, uh, Idaho and Montana. So it was the Whammy States, Washington, Alaska. Uh, uh, etc. Does does so when you have looked at your system, the system that you you've analyzed in Montana, I'm curious how that now re, that those results and that process, how has that been informed, if at all, by the Whammy State, by by what they what, what's coming out of UW Seattle, which just in my you know no credential view is probably the best system in the country. I don't quite understand the question. I know Montana participates in WAMI, which allows us to send um, students from Montana that want that will go study under a WAMI agreement, and then they come back to Montana to practice. So maybe you could clarify for me. I probably am not as knowledgeable on the program. Well, I'm I'm, I'm not saying there's any. I'm I was just curious. I was curious about it because. I spent a lot of time talking to the, the uh, you know, the dean of the medical school at, U at the University of Washington, Seattle, and 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 they they had they were running a system there that 
that was Washington itself is huge, okay? But they were, but their single biggest focus was was how to build a medical system that could that could support small, very small, rural, very highly play, very highly uh, emphasis uh, with very high emphasis on primary care. I remember he, he told me once that there's a city in Western Washington called Forks that gets 200 inches. 200 inches of rain a year. And he said his students out there would rather sell used cars in Seattle than they would to practice medicine in Forks. My, my point simply is, Montana is not, a, is not isolated. Montana is, is, uh, is, is part of a broader regional system. Now, maybe that has no impact. No, I would disagree with that. I would disagree with that. Uh, Montana is very much a rural system, trying to recruit its own doctors. The WAMI program only allows uh, students from Montana to go be educated. Uh, the university does, not and, and then they come back and they do work within the system, but then they move on too. Um, the WAMI program, as far as initiatives like you're talking about, is pretty limited in Montana. Thank you. Um, I have just a first name, uh, Sharon. Um, Sharon, please go ahead. Thanks. Um, I uh, want to add my appreciation and thanks to Marilyn and Chris. I, I think that the presentation was excellent. It was easy to follow. I, you did a great job, Marilyn, making accounting seem easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I appreciate the board for hosting you both. Um, I think this is a very important discussion to have. <laughs> and I, I will say that there was a, uh, some question about um, our hospital's um, ability to, um, their need, I would say, to have prices, what was it, 212% above, percent above uh, Medicare. Um, I do know in the physical therapy world, I'm a physical therapist provider with three with three locations uh, practice, and um, we are at or just a little bit above the Medicare um, payment. So it can be done because I can am doing it, doing it just barely. But um, I would love to have a, a hundred and. 5%. <laughs> but the point is, it doesn't cost the hospital anymore to do outpatient physical therapy. I know this. I, I came from there. I know what their clinics offer and, and so forth. Um, and they presently are making four to 500% more in, in each of the codes. So while we pull in $120, like they'll pull in close to $500 per visit. So um, I am, uh, I'm a I'm hoping that this discussion will allow for more challenging of hospital budgets. I, I love Marilyn, your comfort level in um, challenging the numbers, asking questions, you know, um, and really finding out where, where their opinions of the hospital really are. Um, I do think transparency is a game changer, um, especially with this new federal law. There's no more secrets. There's no more secrets to contracts. It's all out there. What every commercial payer pays every provider in the whole nation is public knowledge. And uh, so uh, that's helpful because before I would only give the information by hearsay. You know, I, I, I did have that awareness that the hospital's payments were growing and the disparity growing, but um, the board really couldn't act on that because they didn't know. And, and so the veil of secrecy gone now will really help us. I mean, the whole point of all of us being here is affordability, right? It's, it's, it's basically allowing for the sustainable healthcare system in, in our country. And um, I just wanted to dive a little bit more, being an independent or private provider not associated with the hospital, um, we're on the verge of, of going out of business uh, because the commercial payers um, have not raised our reimbursement rates over um, almost 15 years. 
they did a, a 3% bump. I should say nothing. But as the inflation rate is well into like 30 plus percent over this time period, there's no way any business anywhere can cannot survive without the ability to um, have the income from the services you provide or the products you provide at least match inflation. So what I'm wondering, and I don't know if you can answer this, is to help a regulatory body, because I do believe the Green Mountain Care Board, I mean, they're tasked with the healthcare system of Vermont as a whole. The hospitals are just a part of that. It's not the whole, I think it's, you know, maybe half of the healthcare system. But without sustainability of the remaining 50 or so percent, how, how is it gonna work? And what I'm thinking is, I don't care to be rich here. I, I've been in the mission of trying to make affordable health care. If I go out of business and my, my um, colleagues' private business go out of business and the only then choice is the hospital, that's being sucked into a higher cost service. So how does your knowledge of, and, and experience help us to navigate the, the board doesn't regulate the private industry, nor I don't think they need to because we're really running on, you know, fumes. So, <laughs> but how, how do you help the regulatory body to keep the sustainability of the whole system, not just the hospital? Did I make sense? Yes. No, it's, it's, uh, I'll respond first. And first, I want to say thank you for your commitment to affordable health care. And I think this board is charged with both affordability and act, you know, access, but affordability is access, right? Affordability is that absolutely access. Um, with respect to reference-based pricing and the transparency that that reference-based pricing can bring, um, I don't want to say that it's going to level the playing field, but it goes a long way to pulling back the veil um, uh, to a system that has by and large been able to take advantage of that, again, that information asymmetry to your detriment and to their advantage. And that, you know, they're meeting the big systems, right? Um, just an anecdote, I, on my way to Washington last week, I ended up sitting next to a woman, she was, happened to be a pediatrician and she spent, uh, I'm a lawyer and a therapist. She spent two hours crying to me on the way to DC when I told her what I was gonna go talk about on the Hill. Um, because of the moral injury inflicted on, upon her as an independent pediatrician, and she was really, you know, forced with a decision, do I engage in this corporate practice of medicine or do I stay independent? And she couldn't, do, she couldn't be, stay independent, so she left the practice of medicine, something that she loved and wanted to continue doing. Um, the importance of independent physicians uh, is paramount, and I hope that this board um, not only sees that globally, but can see how solutions like reference-based pricing and the transparency that it brings can absolutely begin to level the playing field. If people know that it, you know, the price of, you know, going to a, a, a physical therapist office that has, you know, maybe it's in a strip mall, but it has a hospital name on it, and that that's going to cost you three times more than if you go to an independent physician down the street, right? That matters. It matters to purchasers and it matters to people. And maybe we begin to like to bring those into line. Oh, Marilyn, if you have anything to. Oh, I would agree with you. <clears throat> and I, I've been kind of having fun on, first of all, hospitals need to be compliant with hospital price transparency. And they aren't. When you, when you look at the files, I shouldn't say blanket, they aren't, but uh, it, there is, when you get a really good file, and you can look up the particular uh, code, the CPT code or a DRG or APC, and you can look at that code and you look across the line and you see the variation in payments with those insurance companies. And then you look at the minimum and maximum negotiated prices for that. And then you look at the cash price and I mean, a recent study showed that was published, I think G. Biner team did that, showed that 
47% of the time, the cash price was cheaper. But when you look at a procedure, the one I, I particularly was looking at uh, was knee replacements. And you can see the, I mean, thousands of dollars differences. And I don't know Green Mountain Care Board's role, but having been a controller at a large VUCA plan, um, where does that fit into the negotiation, into the work? Where does that fit into affordability? Um, really examining these network negotiations. And Chris, I'd ask your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think as a former purchaser myself, who paid a tremendous amount of money to get access to a negotiated network, right, by Abuka. Um, when you see that the network that you've purchased and the negotiation clout that you think you have has resulted in a price that's five times more than the cash price, 40% on average, um, you begin to wonder, huh, what am I, what am I paying for, right? Like, where's the value in this? And again, that goes to reducing the leverage that they have over you as an independent PT. Um, if, if they're truly, if we truly begin to recalibrate um, prices at a fair rate and put the intermediaries sort of not in their place, but once again, once sort of the, the price and the, the um, is revealed and some of these negotiated rates are re revealed, um, I think it, I think the market will do some self-correcting, but regulatory, uh, you know, regulatory involvement is very much needed because it's not moving quickly enough. Because I, I think a lot of the sort of industry insiders know that they're having the fight, they, they're up for the fight of their lives here in terms of profitability. Um, so we do need regulation and regulators and these types of boards to step, step in to help make sure that that process plays out and plays out quickly. Just one, just one addition to that, because um, right now we don't have any negotiation with um, Blue Cross and Blue Shield or, or MVP. They do, I think, with the hospital and, and others, but, but not with independent physical therapists and every independent physical therapist makes the same price. So could a regulatory board at least require that I have the privilege to negotiate. Well, yeah, when you're you surprised, you me too. When you say you don't have the privilege to negotiate, does that mean they send you a letter and they say, these are your rates for the year, signed here on the dotted line or you're out of the network? That's a lack of meaningful negotiation, but prom I promise you that in their world, in their universe, they've, no they've negotiated that price with you. That is their understanding. And I understand that you haven't had a meaningful negotiation and that's how it works almost in every state. But when they represent the price that you've accepted willingly by signing on the dotted line, because you have to, um, in their opinion, that very much constitutes a negotiation. But there's something- but Because they, yeah. Go ahead. We really don't have competition. So it's like, if I'm to stay in business, I, I, I sort of, they've got me. Do you see what I mean? I don't yeah. have- the ability to go out of network. So um, I'm trying to struggle within network, but it, it probably will come to the same conclusion, whether I go out or they, 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 they force me to go out because they're not paying me what is needed to do the care. Um, but is, is a regulatory body at least able to set um, bound, you know, like certain mm -hmm. expectations, like, you can have this rate increase, but you have to negotiate with each, you know, provider group at least, or, um, or have it like a baseline, like uh, a boundary. You know, if, if you pay the highest amount to one provider, you can't go under a certain amount. So the way that the regulatory agencies across the country have they think that they're dealing with this, and I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm just, is through network adequacy, right? They, the, the thinking goes, if, and now I'm not sort of worried as you as an independent physician or practice, but more broadly, you have the ability to say, I'm going out of network. And so does every other PT out there. And then the carrier would be left with nobody in network for these services. So therefore you're exercising your power and the negotiation would be 
would be, okay, well, what does it take to get you back in? What is that rate? And that's, that's how regulatory bodies have dealt with this issue or have chosen to deal with this issue. Is it meaningful? Has it resulted in the intended benefit that we wanted? Probably not. But that's, that's what net, network adequacy really was intended to make sure that there's a balance there and it, there is some um, you know, room for negotiation or place for it at least. And I don't know the rules of Vermont to know whether there's something in your insurance commissioner rules or Green Mountain Care Board would know whether or not there is a regulatory ability to require direct negotiation, but network adequacy is definitely an issue too. But I think that's a question to ask. I, I don't know your laws. Um, so, um, Ms. Cohen, thank you very much for those good questions. I think those are really great. And um, I'm watching the time because we have to do the one care presentation today. Um, and so we have two more hands raised and we can try and move it along because folks have staff have commitments that they have to get to this evening. Um, so, Walter, please go ahead. Uh, you're muted, Walter. Uh, the iPad didn't click on. Sorry. I have three things and I'll try to make them short. One is the Montana. I have been all across Montana and it is not a big state. It is a vast state. <laughs> I was a hitchhiker um, all through the Grain Belt and the Rocky Mountains and Missoula and Bozeman and everywhere else. Another thing is when early in the presentation and thanks for it we talked about payers and as the care board members know I'm a metronome on that insurance companies are not payers you're right we are the payers thanks and the third issue is that I approach this from I'm not a I'm kind of an anomaly here at the board I'm on the advisory committee. I'm an activist, but I approach everything. I'm a patient. And <clears throat> one of the infuriating things about healthcare is that you need 25 PhDs to figure this out. <laughs> and listening to all of this policy, and I want to relate a little story. I'm a believer in uh, what you're saying, the, the reference base. 16 years ago, I was really sick dying and <clears throat> I was fighting for my life not only against the disease but against the insurance companies the hospitals and the medical system um, <clears throat> when you talk about the difference in prices it brought to mind a story that I had is that I had to have an op three operate four operations the first three were insured and the insurance company, which was an out-of-state outfit at the time, paid $1,500 for that insurance, for that operation. It was something with the bile ducts. Then I lost my job, lost my insurance, something which only happens in America, and had to have the same operation again, exactly the same. Without insurance, it was $20,000. Now, <clears throat> when you talk about accessibility and affordability, that's the difference. The hospital charge master said it was $20,000. Then I said I didn't have insurance, and he said, oh, it's you know $13,000 then. And I had lived in Israel before, which is a single payer country, so I knew. And in Israel, you negotiate everything. <laughs> You don't just buy an iPad, you have to negotiate for it. So I went down and I finally negotiated, ransomed my own life. Now, what do you think about that? And how would reference base stop that? And another question is exactly what is affordability? <laughs> and I'll stop there. One, I love your story I, and your experience. You bring great value here. Uh, one of the things I would the say. The board wants to shut me up. But <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, that's I'm not, not true, Walter. Like to see me out of here, huh? No, that's not true at all. 
<laughs> as far as charge masters, reference-based pricing completely ignores them. Charge master means nothing. So that goes out. You know, I've got a bill here that was presented in an Indiana case of an ablation that a person went through outpatient and no overnight stay. The charge amount, 283000 The allowed amount, about 22000 so charge master numbers, I don't even pay attention to, and that's why I don't uh, I don't appreciate a discount off charge master. So Medicare reference based pricing doesn't even pertain to that. As far as the second part of affordability on how much then that those rates keep going up each year, not charge master. I think that's the role of getting in and looking at the expenses, and looking at the multiple investments that are made by health systems, the multiple separate businesses, the compensations, it's really getting into the expenses. So I guess two parts, I'd ignore charges and I'd focus on those expenses and study those and see what's increasing and why. Um, lots of different things coming along with AI, different things. I, I think it's a good time to focus on the costs of providing service. Chris. Yeah, I would go back to to the the administrative inefficiency of the system that we have. And I don't think you'd um, you know without I think there's a lot that we could sort of blame on the system, and I'm not in a position to say what's right, what's wrong, but what I think is clear, right? And this plays out in the current litigation going on from payers across the country and hospitals across the country is they say we have to overcharge you because you underpay us or deny our claims or don't give us prior authorizations. And then, you know, the insurance company says, well, we have to do all those things, hospital, because you're charging too much and you're submitting false claims or fraudulent, wasteful claims. And so there's this back and forth. Cut the noise. Let's look at the costs. Let's set a price. Let's be transparent about it. And I guarantee you that, you know, projected one third of administrative waste in the system can be redeployed to making healthcare even more affordable and more accessible. And perhaps we might even start to improve health outcomes as opposed to, um, you know, reducing our mortality rates. Is a hospital charging $60 for a three cent aspirin called administrative waste or called waste? Because that's what goes on. <laughs> Oh, no, I, I've, I think I've been on the receiving end of a $60 um, aspirin, but I, I so absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Many times. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Walter, as always. And Ms. Ridson, please go ahead. Hi, yes, I'm Susan Ridson, and I'm the director of an independent practice association. So I just want to say I have not been so excited by a presentation in quite some time. So thank you very much, Marilyn and Chris and the board for having this really important discussion. Um, you guys are emphasizing all the points that we've been trying to raise for years. So just very feel <laughs> very vindicated um, in hearing all of this. And the takeaways for me are um, what we've been saying is transparency follow the money, where, where are things being spent on? And I think that will take us a long way toward a more affordable, accessible system. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. And thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. Ms. Risden was a presenter with Mr. H actually at our last board hearing on issues relating to primary care and did a wonderful job themselves okay. with their colleagues. Um, so this is, you know, the time, timing is great. Susan, I would just to say, our, we never quantified it, but putting in the primary care health centers and driving access there because it was no copay, whatever, and doing the contracts and having health coaches and on referral, that, uh, to me, that's what's really saved the money and really helped us out. It, that was, that's just been a phenomenal uh, for the patient experience and the patient outcome. We should talk offline more about that. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, well, thank you both very, very much for your time today. You're extremely generous with your time and this clearly took a lot of work. So thank you all. This was really appreciated. Um, why don't we take a quick five minute break and we'll turn to our uh, next presentation on um, the ACO. Thank you, everyone. We'll be back. Thank in you. Um, so we'll resume. Um, we have a couple of we ran a little bit late. So I think what we're going to do is we'll go till 430 and see where we are. Um, we may need to take a, a brief break at 4.30 and then continue um, after, but we're going to push ahead. And so I'm going to turn it over to Michelle Sawyer, uh, Marissa Malamed, Jen DiPolito, and Matt Sutter uh, to address One Care Vermont's revised fiscal year 23 budget. Thank you all. Thank you, Chair Foster. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Michelle Sawyer, Health Policy Project Director with the Green Mountain Care Board. Today, we are presenting a preliminary staff review of One Care Vermont's fiscal year 23 revised budget submission and their fiscal year um, 23 certification eligibility verification status update. I'm joined in presenting today by Jennifer DePolito, Senior Health Policy Analyst, Marissa Melamed, Associate Director of Health Systems Policy, and Matthew Sutter, um, Health Systems Finances, principal analyst. And I would like to extend many thanks to um, my colleagues at the ACO team and other staff who have contributed to this presentation today. So here's the agenda for the presentation. We will start with a review on the process uh, and background information. Jen will lead us through the certification section. Marissa, Matt, and myself will review the revised budget submission. Um, and then we will briefly review um, the budget order conditions, and we uh, will have time, hopefully, for board questions and discussion at the end. Uh, and here is a timeline for the next month of this revised budget process. On Friday the 5th, One Care Vermont will have their hearing on their revised budget. This meeting is starting at 8.30 in the morning. On Wednesday, May 17th, the staff will present recommendations for their revised budget, and there is a potential vote held for both May 24th and May 31st. The public comment period is open until the 21st, uh, 24th of May. Um, and as I don't, the slides aren't up if you wanna be sharing them. I do, thank you very much. <laughs> Much appreciated. There okay. it is. Okay, perfect. There's our agenda. So um, as of this date, there has only been a single public comment. I'll briefly um, describe what it encompasses. This comment encouraged the board to consider alternative models of healthcare reform that cover a larger proportion of Vermonters. It also recommended that One Care's operating costs be further reduced. Uh, that the state should both implement fixed prospective payments and disperse population health management funds to providers instead of the ACO, and that One Care should be held accountable for not expanding primary care capacity. This comment also stated that because One Care executives have received 100% of the variable pay their positions are eligible to receive, that this variable aspect of their pay should be disregarded. Overall, the comment recommended that the board needs to address the most pressing health care issues facing Vermonters, um, including um, access and cost, and uh, that the state provide leadership to address systemic health care uh, challenges. So the Green Mountain Care Board has been tasked with oversight of accountable care organizations as outlined in 18 VSA 9382 and Rule 5. Oversight of ACOs includes the process of certification, um, and the board also reviews the ACOs budget annually in the fall. Um, because payer contracts and attribution are finalized by the spring of the budget year, the ACO submits a revised budget, which is what we are reviewing today. Um, in this case, because of the loss of a payer program between the initial budget and the revised budget, the budget has sub uh, substantially changed. Uh, in addition to the finalized payer programs and the starting attribution figures, the revised budget incorporates specific conditions in the budget order from December. 
Uh, the budget adjustment process is established in Rule 4.407. Um, if performance has varied substantially from the ACO's budget, then upon the request of the ACO, the board can adjust the ACO's budget. One Care has not submitted a budget, a budget amendment request at this time. This slide is for reference. Um, I'll just point out that the board may take action to compel compliance with an established budget. Um, uh, and currently the last approved budget was the one voted upon by the board in December of 2022. Here's a list of items that One Care is required to present to the board during their hearing, which is scheduled for this Friday. In addition to these topics, we have requested that they, they, they present on the issue of executive compensation as part of their ongoing certification eligibility verification for 2023. And on that note, I will I will turn it over to Jen DiPolito to walk us through the current state of certification. Thank you, Michelle. Um, perfect, you can move to the next slide. Can you all hear me? Great. Um, so the certification of One Care Vermont for fiscal year 2023 has been under review since August of 2022, when One Care submitted their annual certification eligibility verification form. Under GMCB rule, a certified ACO must annually submit to the board a verification that the ACO continues to meet the requirements for certification under statute and rule. And the ACO must also submit to the board any material changes in policies, procedures, organizational structure, provider networks, health information infrastructure, or other matters covered by the certification requirements. OneCare is currently the only certified ACO in Vermont, and it was certified by the board in 2018, and it has been certified since then. So procedurally this year, the board issued a certification eligibility form to OneCare in June of 2022, and OneCare submitted the form to the board in August, uh, on August 31st of 2022. OneCare also provided responses to GMCB staff follow-up questions in October, and following the staff's review of these materials, the staff requested additional information from OneCare about OneCare's executive compensation under Rule 5, Section 5.203A. OneCare responded to this request in March of 2023, and these documents are available publicly on the GMCB website. The staff is currently preparing a memo for the board covering a review of each section of the rule. So the purpose of, for the purposes of this presentation, I'm only gonna focus on the area of leadership and management and specifically on the additional information the board received in March from OneCare regarding their executive compensation. So as part of maintaining certification, executive compensation, as described in board issued guidance from May of 2021, uh, they must be, be structured to achieve specific and measurable goals that support the ACO's efforts to reduce cost growth or improve the quality and overall care of enrollees or both. So while some information was shared with the board regarding the executive compensation structure at One Care when they initially submitted their materials in September last year and when they responded to questions back in October, the GMCB staff requested the, this additional information, which included the final fiscal year 2023 corporate goals upon which executive variable pay is based, all metrics associated with these goals, a description of any numerical scoring used to determine how the achievement or partial achievement of goals are scored to correlate with the amount of variable pay awarded, variable pay ranges for eligible executive positions for FY23, and all UVM Health Network policies related to executive compensation and variable compensation. Um, One Care's FY23 corporate goals upon which their executive variable pay is based are listed here. One Care noted in their submission that variable compensation may consist of multiple components such as corporate goal achievement, individual goals, or other factors as determined by the UVM Health Network Compensation Committee. These components and weights may vary from year to year and by level of leadership. So for 2023, One Care noted that 100% of their variable compensation is tied to One Care corporate goal achievement. Um, variable pay ranges as a percentage of base pay for each level of leadership are listed here. Determination of the attainment of these goals is made by the next level of leadership. And in the case of the CEO, the executive committee of the One Care Board of Managers reviews and makes recommendations to the One Care Board of Managers. And the full One Care Board of Managers must approve the attainment of these goals. Uh, you can move to the next slide, please. 
Um, one CARES fiscal year 23 corporate goals upon which their executive variable pay is based and their associated metrics are presented here as submitted by One Care. And One Care also submitted their corporate goal variable compensation scoring methodology, UVM Health Network's bylaws, executive compensation philosophy, and salary benchmarks, all of which can be found on the GMCB website. So in April of 2023, One Care. OneCare's Board of Managers meeting packet included a quarter one update on OneCare's FY23 corporate goals, which is presented on the following slide. Um, and the table here indicates that OneCare has completed 25% of, of each goal per measure in quarter one. And of note is that OneCare's revised data and analytics transition date, which is now projected for October of 2023, and also their ongoing selection and contract negotiation for an external national valuation contractor. So regarding next steps, One Care will present on their FY23 revised budget on Friday, May 5th, um, and they may present additional information related to executive compensation then. The board does not need to take any action regarding certification eligibility at this time. And as in prior years, staff will send a memo to the board outlining a full review of certification eligibility verification for FY23. Um, and action would only be needed if the board concluded that OneCare no longer met the requirements for to be eligible for certification. And in that case, the board would provide notice to the ACO and an opportunity to respond before requiring corrective action. So now I'll turn it back to Michelle to go over One Care's revised budget. Perfect. Thank you, Jen. Um, so we'll now start looking at the FY23 revised budget. We have organized this section by budget order condition in numerical order, um, but because not all budget order conditions impacted the revised budget, we will not touch on every budget order condition. So I'm going to turn it over to Marissa to start off with condition one. Thank you, Michelle and Jen. I'm going to walk you through a high level review of what was required for the ACO benchmarking report by March 31st, which we did receive, and next steps for this requirement. As a reminder, this condition is part of a multi year requirement started in 2021 for One Care to adopt a performance benchmarking tool for their Medicare program to support network performance management and regulatory reporting. We anticipated that uh, this might be an iterative process to land on the methodology and format of the report that the Green Mountain Care Board will incorporate into ACO guidance and track year over year. This is the second report that has been submitted by One Care, and I will endeavor to describe uh, the changes, which um, we had spoken about it during the budget review process uh, in the fall. Um, the full report that was submitted and the narrative that accompanies it is posted on our website, um, so this is, is an overview. You can go to the next slide. I'm going to briefly try to go through the requirements and the sort of current review of the submission. Uh, so the overall requirement is to allow the ACO and the Green Mountain Care Board to assess OneCare's performance against peer ACOs or integrated health systems by comparing one care ACO level performance metrics to a broad national cohort of ACOs in five key areas as available and appropriate. And just I have to always remind people that this is Medicare uh, data only. Um, so the submission we did uh, receive on March 31st, um, the report includes a benchmark analysis for two national cohorts. Um, I'll refer to them or, or they are called the peer ACO cohort and the all ACO cohort. Um, which is a, both our national sample. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more. And the metrics were selected by One Care based on a broad list that were provided by GMCB in the requirements. Uh, next slide. The next requirement is that the report compare ACO performance metrics to at least the 50th and 90th percentiles, so comparison by quartile or decile is preferred by each metric to allow for identification of top performers by measure in each key area. So the submission did include uh, an analysis of the 10th, 50th, and 90th percentile comparisons for the all ACO cohort. For the peer ACO cohort, just the average is provided. Um, there's a note um, with the report um, that says that the 10th, 50th, and 90th percentile cohorts are calculated 
based on the 10th, 50th, and 90th percentile of each risk-adjusted metric calculated in isolation. So each metric, um, the ACO performance is ranked. Um, so this means that um, the um, some measures of high performance may be difficult to interpret because they rely on an interrelationship of metrics, for example, um, inpatient and, and SNF admissions. And we will have more time to talk about what that means. Um, and I suspect uh, on, at this meeting and uh, on Friday. Uh, okay, so I did have a slide that describes it a little clearer. Um, the peer ACO cohort is a group of 20 ACOs uh, selected based on exclusion criteria that's uh, in their report. Um, the outcome or the output of the report indicates where one care is performing green, better, or worse, red than the average. Um, and note there are inverse metrics in that report where higher is better and the color coding is not adjusted. So the report as it is posted is a little bit hard to interpret, um, at least at first glance with the eye, because some of it is reversed. Um, that report also does not indicate top performing ACOs um, by metric or, or overall. It's better or worse than the average. The all ACO cohort consists of the full Medicare um, fee-for-service data set, which is 513 ACOs. Um, again, the report indicates where one care performance is better or worse than the ACO at the 10th, 50th, and 90th percentile. So there's more granularity. However, um, it it indicates uh, top performing ACO by metric and the best comparison ACO may be likely or it is likely different for each metric. Um, so you'd have to dig a little deeper to understand um, uh, how those metrics are related um, and what makes a top performing ACO. Next slide. Um, the next requirement is to enhance OneCare's ACO level performance management strategy, including integration of best practices and priority opportunities identified through benchmarking and peer networking in the OneCare quality evaluation and improvement program. Um, OneCare states in the narrative that intends to use the report to identify areas of opportunity and to work with its vendor to identify high performing organizations within its national ACO peer cohort that align with OneCare's priorities. Um, so we, I ex expect we hear more about that from them. Um, this is the second iteration of this report. Again, the first was submitted and reviewed um, in the fall. Um, and I, we do, I, I suspect that we've moved on to this new one, but there are some pros and cons about the way the reports were um, about the methodology. So we do wanna confirm which report OneCare intends to maintain for their performance management and improvement um, processes internally. Um, and again, OneCare and the GMCB continue to discuss how the report will meet um, this requirement. Um, presumably, I would say, um, I'll just make one more note. You don't have to go back though. Um, OneCare is provided information about top performers from the, the vendor who puts the report together and is then able to connect with those organizations to adopt best practices and lessons learned. Okay, um, the report will, is also intended to improve regulatory reporting and performance assessment, assessment by providing the benchmarking comparisons to target at least semi-annually. Um, so we are incorporating a spring and a fall submission. Um, the FY23 guidance did lay out future expectations for setting targets for performance benchmarks at or above the 50th percentile. Um, and this would be sort of included in their, in their budget review. Um, this was a, a put in the FY23 guidance, not um, in an enforced way, but in a, this is the, a direction that we're trying to move. And so again, this will be discussed as part of the FY24 budget guidance, um, which will commence after this review in spring of 23. Next slide, this is the last requirement. Um, the updated benchmarking report must be submitted to the board by March 31st, um, it was. Um, it has to meet the standards and methods for the report as specified by this order um, in the ACO reporting manual. And the GMCB board chair is authorized to delegate authority to one or two board members and the Green Mountain Care Board Director of Health Systems Policy to review and approve proposed revisions to this report. Um, so again, we're still assessing this report. We have been um, thankful to have um, board member Tom Walsh looking at this more closely with us 
um, looking at this report more closely with us as well. Okay, so we have a couple of key questions for your consideration um, just to think about um, as you know, in this presentation or kind of in the context of when we hear from One Care um, and their review of this report. Um, so I'll, I'll try to go through these um, briefly. So again, I mentioned this is an iterative process. This is question one. Um, the board needs to decide if it's ready to accept this report for use as a consistent performance measurement tool. Um, and also just a confirmation from One Care that they do intend to use this report in creating their budget and then their quality evaluation and improvement program. One of the ideas for the report is that, um, you know, the, the board would be able to use a report such as this. It's kind of only one, one report of several that could be used, but to help the board um, understand One Care's priorities, how they're setting those priorities and how they are sort of measuring success and how those priorities show up in their budget. Um, the board required establishing ACL performance benchmarks to help answer this following question sort of in plain English. We want to know how well can an ACL perform in each metric, sort of like what's the what's the top? Um, how does one care perform in each metric in comparison to an ACO that gets the best result in each metric? Um, understanding that there's a lot of complicated relationships between these metrics. And again, the ultimate objective for the board is to have a valid report to use to track relevant performance metrics over time and to understand how One Care uses those metrics to set clinical priorities and make budgeting decisions. Uh, next slide. So we have a couple of practical questions um, that we want to confirm with One Care uh, and or their vendor, and that is it sort of valid to use this report to allow GMCB to track one care performance over time. You'll see the way the report is set up. It's the, the, the different years are on different tabs. It's a little hard to track. I'm gonna show you a template where we might put those together, um, but we want to hear that this is, you know, this is sort of a valid way to use the report. Um, also, we wanna better understand the strengths and weaknesses of the report to show us the relationship between one care efforts and performance improvement. Um, and does this report allow One Care to calculate a return on investment of population health investments, payment initiatives, and administrative expenses? Um, basically, an understanding of does it, would allow you to check, track, say, if you implement this intervention, how much does it cost? What might your return be um, on total cost of care um, through improving improving outcomes? And then I think my final slide is a template, a draft template report that I think is ultimately um, what we would like to see. So this is a selection of metrics. Um, you know, there's a lot of metrics on there. It's hard to look at them all at once. Um, so the board could determine what their priority metrics are. Um, and then to put the data into this report year over year um, and compare one care to the top ACOs. This particular um, setup here doesn't have compared to the average. It just has compared to the top. You could probably color code so you could get both in here um, and try to keep it uh, simple. Um, and um, it's also important to um, note that the top 10 percentile in the way that this report is set up is not a static group of ACOs. So again, there's in that cohort, it's very large of 513. Um, it's likely a different ACO that's sort of in that top group for each metric. So that would be a lot of. Uh, so tracking and understanding best practices. Um, so we've considered a couple, you know, in a previous iteration of the report, they did a top 10th percentile of only 20 ACOs, which means two, you know, so then you're comparing one care to, to two top performing ACOs. Um, we felt that group was a little small. This group is maybe a little large. We can talk through the, the pros and cons. Um, but I put, I put this as a visual. We do actually have the data to fill in these cells. I didn't do it now because I didn't want to focus on um, performance measurement. I wanted to, to sort of try to get to a consensus of what the board would like to see um, and how they'd like to use this report. And I think that's all for this uh, condition. I will turn it back to Michelle. Perfect. Thank you, Marissa. Okay, so this slide is really provided for context. Um, condition five itself does not directly um, direct change to the revised budget, 
but the circumstances that the condition originated from do impact the revised budget. Um, at the time of the initial budget submission in the fall, uh, One Care had been operating under the assumption of a continued pair contract with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. Um, when in late December, the board received notice that Blue Cross Blue Shield did not plan to continue its participation in One Care for 2023, the board required that One Care submit an updated budget no later than January 30th, reflecting the effects of the of Blue Cross Blue Shield's decision not to participate. Um, there was a board meeting held on March 2nd to discuss this updated budget, uh, the repercussions and potential paths forward. Um, and as you can see uh, from this slide that is pulled from that March 2nd um, meeting, the loss of the Blue Cross Blue Shield payer program resulted in an unexpected $1.8 million in hospital dues being left over. Um, and there it's left over due to the loss of those attributed lives. Um, this slide is pulled directly from there to remind us of what the potential approaches could be for those uh, dollars. The options as outlined in the slide were to reduce hospital dues, so basically return the 1.8 back to the hospitals. Um, One Care could reinvest those fees into existing primary care programs um, or reinvest fees into other ACO programs. Um, and in a few minutes, we will be reviewing how One Care chose to proceed with those dollars. Condition 11 required One Care Vermont to submit a revised budget that included this list of documentation by March 31st, 2023. Uh, this was completed and much of what we are discussing today is a review of this submission. All right, Condition 11A uh, required that One Care submit all finalized payer contracts the contracts for Medicare, Medicaid, and MVP have been submitted. There is an additional payer program that is currently undergoing contract negotiations, so OneCare has not yet shared this contract with us. It is a new UVM Health Network self-funded program. Um, we have limited information about this program at this time, um, but we will share what we do know on future slides. Condition 11B required that One Care submit updated attribution numbers by payer. This slide outlines the payer programs, participations uh, by the number of hospitals and hospital types, and also the starting attribution as estimated in the initial budget versus the starting attribution as reported in the revised budget. So you can see that on the Medicare line, um, the uh, attribution in the initial budget was um, 67,558, and that has increased by about uh, 1,000 lives. You can see on the Medicaid line that there was a significant jump in starting attribution with this revised budget. Um, the Blue Cross Blue Shield live, you can see that there were uh, initially almost 93,000 lives, and in the revised budget, there aren't any. Um, the UVM Health Network self-funded program, uh, there are, were zero in the initial budget because it was, did not yet exist, um, but in this revised budget, we picked up um, about 11,000 lives, and it's our understanding that the, of those 11,000 lives, they were previously part of those Blue Cross Blue Shield cohort. Um, MVP starting attribution did decrease um, slight, significantly between the initial and revised budget, um, and then the overall change uh, between the initial and revised budget was a loss of about 66,000 lives, which is a 22% reduction in overall lives, which is actually smaller than what we had been anticipating in January. This slide uh, demonstrates the change between starting attribution and average attribution over the course of the year. This is of particular interest in 2023 because of the Medicaid redeterminations that are occurring at a national level. level. Um, DIVA began this process in Vermont in April, and it is expected that the number of Vermonters with Medicaid coverage will decrease due to these redeterminations. By comparing what the change was between starting and average attribution in fiscal year 22 to what is anticipated in fiscal year 23, we can see that OneCare is anticipating a slightly larger drop in Medicaid lives. 
in 2022, there was a 9.75% drop between starting and average attributions. This is before redetermination started. Um, and in the initial budget, they predicted a 13.2% reduction. And in the revised budget, there's a drop of 11.3%. Um, the staff do want to make note that the starting attribution numbers provided by OneCare has fluctuated significantly. Um, in the initial budget, they predicted about 126,000 lives for Medicaid. In the revised budget, they reported 142,000 lives. And in their quarter one reporting, which we received at the end of April, it appeared that the starting attribution was about 131,000 lives. Um, and the staff have asked OneCare to clarify this variation. Um, and for more information on Medicaid redeterminations, anyone can visit DIVA's redetermination webpage at www.diva.vermont.gov slash unwinding. Um, and I will now turn it over to Matt, who will walk us through the ACO's financials. Can you all hear me fine? Great, thanks. Um, so looking first is at a really high level income statement, um, just to orient you, you can see the revenue rows at the top and the expenses at the bottom. Um, just want to kind of point out, you can see that $448 million um, decreased to both lines mirrored um, on the expense and revenue side, uh, reflecting that there's no budgeted net income uh, projected. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, this is the same information. I just wanted to kind of expand the expense side out a little bit more so we can see um, like a detailed detail of where things are moving. Um, here you can see the the uh, decrease in the program target revenue mirrored on in the expense line. That's basically the pass through dollars, um, and then the operating expense cuts um, below is another major category um, as part of their. One of their conditions, they were required to cut operating expenses by 2%, and um, I'll speak about it a little bit more later, but they've done so, um, cutting 2.6%. And we can go to the next slide. So the same as the other view, except we've just condensed the expenses in OPEX, and we're just looking at um, the PHM and payment reform programs. There's quite a bit of movement between these lines. So I just wanted to make them available so you can see um, Kind of the inner movement, but the uh, net was about eight hundred fifty thousand, fifty-seven thousand dollar increase um, when you include FPP. Um, also, I'll, I'll orient you. There's a um, one point six million dollars on this slide. You can see for mental health screening initiative that was not included in the original budget, which is um, somewhat offsetting some of the PHM cuts, which you're saying kind of as a result of the, the self-funded program and, and um, attribution updates. Next slide. So just looking real quick, just looking um, at operating expenses, you can see they um, cut by 2.6%. And here are some um, major categories that they, they cut in the amounts. Well, we can jump to the next slide and kind of shows the same information, just in terms of a waterfall chart, so you can kind of get a, a sense of the scale. Um, you can see an increase in contracted services, and part of that is a shifting of some um, previously staff duties to um, contract labor. And then uh, the next slide. So this is again looking at the operating expenses, this time just uh, as a concentration. So, you know, looking at 100% of their revised budget, 100% of their initial budget, what's the breakout along those? Category you saw before, and um, you can you can see that shift from um, salary and benefits to contracted services, and you can also see the executive salaries um, being reduced slightly relative to their initial submission. And this is just a table. We're we're one cares now providing us some more detailed information in our uh, budget system when they submit and. We're able to look more at staff counts more granularly. Um, this is just showing the change from FY22, some of the movement, and um, we, we're also collecting um, compensation amounts for 
along these lines too. So we'll be able to provide more detailed reporting in future periods. And then um, just looking at the sources, um, I guess the, the uh, PHM programs by provider type. So um, you can see some, uh, some changes uh, largely due to the movements that we've kind of discussed before, but um, just wanted to provide this information so you can see kind of where that's playing out and who, who it's affecting. Um, and I th think that was it. I think Michelle, were you going to discuss this? I can. I can yeah, talk to you. I can get okay. this. Thank you so much, Matt. Great. Thank you. All right. So this table outlines the changes in the number of attributed lives over the course of the ACO's operations, and the amount of population health spending and operating expenses in each of those years. Um, and then we calculated how many dollars per attributed life were spent on both population health spending and operational expenses. Um, and the next slide is a visual of this data. So the bars represent the number of attributed lives in each program year of the ACO. Uh, the teal line represents the amount of population health spending per attributed life in each year and the yellow line uh, represents the amount of operating dollars spent per attributed life in each year. And as you can see in the early years, attribution was low, leading to higher spending per life in both population health and operations. And the operational expenses really leveled off, but um, with the drop in attributed lives for 2023 due to the loss of those Blue Cross Blue Shield lives, um, the ratio of dollars to lives has increased a bit to 77 uh, in operating ex expenses per life. Population health spending has varied um, and it seems to be less closely tied to the number of attributed lives. Uh, Michelle, can you pause there for just one second? Absolutely. All right, thank you. All right, so condition 11 required that one care report on any changes made to population health programs. A new uh, initiative was added to one care's population health offerings, the mental health screening and follow up initiative. In an effort to support both mental health initiatives and primary care practices, the program offers incentive payments to providers who implement a mental health screening protocol and agree to electronically document the results of these screenings, as well as treatment and follow-up procedures for any positive screens. Um, the mental health screening initiative payments will be paid to qualifying primary care participants according to estimated mid-year assigned attributed lives for all ACO programs at the aggregate payment rate of $9.72 per assigned attributed life. Um, the mental health screenings include the PHQ-9, uh, the PHQ-2 plus the CSSRS, uh, the PHQA and the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale. Condition 11G required that one care notify the board of any changes to its risk model. Um, this is tied to Condition 16, which, as abbreviated here, states that one care shall hold at least 3.9 million of the risk associated with the Medicare Advanced Shared Savings Payments and must not pass that amount along uh, amount of the risk onto any one care network participants. Um, it appears they have done so and now hold 4.4 million dollars in downside risk and um, eight uh, eight hundred sixty one thousand in potential gain um, at the entity level. The Medicaid risk corridors uh, have been expanded since the initial budget and are now at three percent. Uh, the MVP, MVP corridor also shifted and um, for the UVM Health Network self-funded plan, it's it's new for the uh, since the initial budget. This slide shows uh, the budgeted risk between 2019 and 2023 and the percent of the risk held at the entity level versus the risk delegated to the provider network. Um, the budgeted risk is worth showing here because it is the risk 
level one care was planning for prior to the onset of the pandemic, uh, when the risk levels, um, you know, in response to the pandemic, risk levels were significantly lowered. Um, in their initial budget, one care brought the total risk level back up closer to pre-pandemic levels for 2023. But the loss of the Blue Cross Blue Shield payer program reduced the amount of risk held at the network uh, level overall. Um, the one care held portion of risk in the initial budget was also quite a bit lower than it was pre-COVID. Um, but for context, one care typically has taken on uh, risk as a glide path to support HSAs who are newly joining payer programs but not ready to, uh, to take on the full risk themselves in the first year. Um, and in the revised budget, you can see that one care held risk is at a higher proportion of the total overall risk as a result of budget order condition 16. That is where you see the Medicare advanced shared savings dollars. Um, the one item that this is a look very similar to the last slide, but the one thing that wasn't shown is the percentage of risk relative to the total cost of care. Um, you can see that pre-pandemic, it was right around 4%, and since then, it has not yet returned back to those same levels. Um, since we're calling out one care held risk, we also want to call out one care net assets and equity, um, which includes a reserve of 3.9 million that the board required in its 2019 budget order, uh, as well as net assets. One, uh, one care also has a $10 million line of credit as required by Medicare. All right, condition 11H required one care to report on the sources for their population health funding. Overall, there was a decrease in this funding from 29.9 million to 26.3 mil uh, million between the initial and revised budgets. Um, additionally, the way that in, in which DIVA supports these programs has evolved with the changing of the PHM program. Um, when the VBIF program was active, DIVA offered $2 million in funding for participating providers serving Medicaid attributed lives under this program. Um, which was paid directly to those providers and not through OneCare. Um, and now that the VBIF program has really just become part of the PHM program, DIVA is paying all PHM bonus payments earned by providers for serving Medicaid attributed lives directly to those providers and not through OneCare. Um, the uh, mental health initiative is fully funded from hospital dues and uh, funding for the Dulce program has shifted from DIVA um, in the initial budget to hospital dues in the revised budget. This is just clarifying that the 1.8 million in hospitals uh, in the hospital dues um, or participation fees that were that, that the board discussed on March 2nd have been allocated mostly to the mental health initiative, um, with some also going to the Dulce and the remainder to the PHM program. Condition 11J required that one care report on their commercial FPP targets. Um, they last reported these to the board in July of 2022, and the target had been set at 0% at that time, where it remains still. Um, with the withdraw withdrawal of Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, all commercial FPP amounts were lost. And here are the key takeaways from One Care's fiscal year 23 revised budget. There is a new payer program, the UVM Health Network Self Funded Program. Um, there were changes in pay both payer risk corridors and the amount of One Care held risk. Um, there is the new mental health screening and treatment initiative. Uh, and the 1.8 million in hospital participation fees um, were fully uh, spent on um, population health efforts. And there was a reduction in their operating budget. Um, the next several slides are basically a status chart um, where we, we can review where we're at in this point of the year with the budget conditions. Um, several of them are considered complete. Um, most are areas where we continue to monitor until the budget is closed out at the end of the performance year. Um, 
No board action is required today, um, but we will, I just want to highlight the ones that we will be discussing at the next staff presentation on May 17th. So the first uh, condition, the ACO benchmarking system, we will have additional staff analyses um, available on uh, May 17th. Um, Condition number eight, there is a technical correction that's necessary, which we will uh, review and discuss on the 17th as well. Um, we will discuss condition number 10. Um, that has to do with the um, notification of any material change to a budget, um, and we'll discuss that then. Um, and condition 15. Um, we reviews, reviewed that today. There will be a vote necessary, so there will be additional discussion um, on the 17th. And the other two are monitored. So now, um, if it pleases you, Chair, I'll hand it back over to you for uh, board questions and discussion. That was great. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I'll just open it up to the board members for any questions or comments they may have. Um, appreciating that we will have another presentation Friday and then another in a couple of weeks here. Um, I, I have a, go ahead, Dave. Go ahead, Dave. I have a quick question. Um, regarding the uh, operating expense per attributed live. Do, do operating expenses include any fixed perspective payments, uh, population health payments, any payments to providers, or is it purely operating expenses? Uh, purely operating expenses, um, salaries, software, contracted services, that sort of thing. Okay, and so that went from fifty three dollars to $77 per attributed live in the last year is what I saw in that slide, which I just, is a substantial percentage increase, but that's all I wanted to point out there. I, I think if I just don't understand that correctly. It sounds like you are interpreting that correctly. From the initial, and from the initial to the final. Yep, okay. Not from yes, the and that, you know, the, yep. that ratio is changed because of the loss of the, you know, mm -hmm. the 22% reduction in attributed lives. Okay. And then on slide 40, um, there was some funding to that went down. Do you know, do you know anything about the million dollars less to FQHCs and the, um, substantial decrease to the designated agencies. Do you know if that's related to Blue Cross Blue Shield payments or is that, do, do you, are you aware of what led to that decline? I'll, I'll let Matt chime in, but it is my understanding that these reductions mainly were around the loss of attributed lives. Um, but I invite anybody okay. on my team to, to chime in if there's might be other reasons. I think I think one care will have to speak to that a little bit more. OK, all right. that's all I have. Thanks. I have one related to that on slide 40. Um, were these uh, changes from initial to revised, were they just proportionate to the number of lives before? So I.e. But they just spread across equally how much it was going down, or is there some sort of adjustment to where they were putting spending? after the Blue Cross withdrawal? That, that's a great question and not an analysis that the staff has done at this point, but happy to get more information about that and, and look into that um, if it's not clearly addressed on Friday. Okay, I'll just put a pin in it. Um, I might I might ask them on Friday if we don't have other information. Oh, go ahead, Matt. I see. Yeah, okay. chime in, Matt. So I I just wanted to add just for uh, just to be completely fair. So this is looking at just the PH 
and programs without FPP. Now there was an increase to FPP, and if you include that along these, uh, break it down along these categories also, the decrease, it, it does not look as significant. Um, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, so I don't wanna speak to it, but I can provide that information, um, provide that to you all after the call. That might be helpful to see. Um, okay. I, I can provide the same table just with, um, with FPP included as well. I can maybe provide a little bit, um, just another way to think about this for for Friday. Um, we had the hospital dues um, that are funding population health uh, stayed, they, they kept that level um, so they can continue to fund the programs, um, which as Michelle said, was part of the discussion on March 2nd. Um, this decrease overall in PHM, um, like like Matt and others said, I think one girl have to speak to. I would I would assume that it has to do with loss of lives, um, but I don't totally know for sure. In terms of the revenue side, they did maintain the revenue side, um, is my understanding. In terms of collecting the hospital dues that they expected to collect in the original budget and allocating that to population health programs. I don't know if that helps or not. Yeah. Right. Um, I think could you just pull up slide 39? It's going kind of quickly. So fiscal year 22, this is the, the what they submitted in the fall. Well, that's from their their um, presentation slides. I don't think we required them to submit it as like an appendix in the past, but it was presented in the past year. Okay. And then the change of 12 FTEs, 11.1 .1 to value-based care, is that because, or 11.9, is that because that's due to the shift of contracting folks to UVM for the data? We don't we don't have exact details on that, but at least a portion of that is our, our data folks moving over to the health network. Yes. Okay. Right. Okay, I have nothing else. You all actually just got my questions. I had similar questions about the drop in um, Population health expenditures. So that'll be helpful, Matt, to get that data. I had a similar question about the FTC count and uh, FTE count. And then I also am just really be curious to hear from them on Friday about the starting attribution for Medicaid. I know you've asked questions about that, but um, you know the starting attribution seems quite higher in a year when we're having um, you know revaluations of that. So th those are my predominant questions. Just to foreshadow what I might ask about on Friday if we don't hear more information. So in the meantime, but thank you. I, um, just one question um, and purely clarification for me. On slide 47, it's, there's a statement about population health funding, um, I think through DIVA. And I want to try to square that with the table listing population health payments per attributable life. I think that might have been slide 41. So here's here's the thing that confused me. That um, and then there's the table that has population health expenditures. Um, does the change to flowing through Diva affect this table? That is a good question. I it is my understanding that the diva money was not included in this table. So that that diva money in VBAIF would have shown up in 2022, um, and then for both the or, or and then for um, 2023 that difference in funding as well direct to provider. I don't believe is captured, but Tom, I will double check 
and I can certainly let you know how those were calculated exactly, whether it includes that money or not. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and am I correct that we need a break at 4.30 for folks? Just, I need just five minutes Perfect. and I'll okay. be right so back. Yeah, yeah. All right. So we'll turn real quick to the healthcare advocate. That's not to limit your time, but please go ahead. That's okay. Um, thanks, Chair Foster. Most of our, I'm well, I'm going to say all of our comments, questions, and concerns, I think we're just going to save for the hearing on Friday. So we can keep it super brief. Thanks. Great. Okay. Um, so Michelle, why don't we take a break now? We'll come back at, we'll take 10 minutes, 437. And if you need more time, send me a message and I'll, I'll wait. Um, but so it's 437. Thank you. Thank you. To public comment via the raise your hand function. Great. Um, seeing none. Um, thank you all very much. Oh, no, hang on. We got one. Um, Ms. Wasserman, how are you? Please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I just had uh, one interesting, uh, one point I'd like to question. Um, it would be valuable if we were able to determine the percent of One Care's population health management payments that were paid to hospitals, who, as we all know, own the large majority of Vermont's primary care practices, and then also contrast that with the percent uh, paid to independent primary care practices for whom these payments are critical. And additionally, uh, I would hope that One Care on Friday could clearly account for the funds paid to hospitals. And the main question is, is does, did, the, did the hospital's primary care physicians directly benefit from these funds, or did the funds go to the hospital's bottom line? Very good, good Great questions. Good Thank question. you very much. Any other public comment? Okay, great. Um, thank you all for putting this together for us. Um, great job, as always, so thank you. And with that, is there any old business to come before the board? Any new business? And is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. I will second it. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And the vote carries and the meeting is adjourned. Everyone have a great evening. Thank you.